This is the bear market that won't end. The time to move into a little bit more duration has come. The thing that we have to try and do is to trade off this volatility that we see persistently in the equity market. I'm not sure that we will see disruption from this slowdown uh, in the economy. The pace of disinflation over the next year, I think, is likely to be quite a lot quicker than markets expect. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is CPI Wednesday, oh, live CPI from New York City Wednesday. for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance uh, on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive two tenths of 1%. TK the data, two hours and 30 minutes away. Yeah, yesterday was Euro Parity Tuesday. I mean, you know, it's too much. I love what Kitschuk said in his note. Can we all get over the idea? What did he of, say, of Tom? The, I can't remember the insanity of Euro Parity. <laughs> Just, but you know, enough. It. But, but actually, ever. this is serious. This price change dynamic today was beneath the headline numbers is going to be stunning, John. David Rosenberg saying, everybody calm down. We're going to see disinflation. And as you know, John, could we see double digit on the other side of that debate? How sticky will it be, Tom, into year end? That's got to be the focus of the yes, conversation. Yes, I think the x-axis is the, yes. This is really important, John. It's not going to be about level so much, the y-axis. It's about trying to determine the x-axis and the partition between goods and services. That goods inflation has to come down. Lisa, headline CPI, the estimate at the moment in our survey, 8.8%. This market will be focused on the core month-over-month -month figure and going through all the compositional shifts we might see. That's exactly where I wanted to go. Do you think that the market actually will be focused on that? Or do you think that if we get a 9%, 9.1% inflation rate, the go. headline CPI, Six that that will rule the mood on markets more than anything that we see month over month in core CPI? I mean, it's an honest question, John, at a time where the Fed is saying we don't want to parse out too many nuances given how high inflation is relative to history. So what's the market interested in? The market's interested in what the Fed might do in response to the economic data. Correct. We can agree on that. Yes. This Fed is far more sensitive to upside surprises than they will be downside surprises. They will need to see a string of softening CPI prints through the next several months to get them to back away anytime soon. Especially since there are certain inputs that are expected to increase in terms of, for example, rent and rent pressure that is expected to actually add to CPI later in the year, even though you do expect to see some sort of easing from the pressure of gas prices. All of the nuances here leading people to say the core might not matter quite as much as it has traditionally as the full benchmark the Fed considers. So we throw in some <laughs> corporate guidance as yes. well. Interesting to hear from Google. Yes. Who had this to say, Tom. They're planning to slow hiring plans for the remainder of the year. There was some commentary from the CEO, but I love this line. We need to show more hunger than we've shown on sunnier days, Tom. Yeah, I, I think these notes are starting to come out. Joe Feldman over at Telsey Advisory Group with a smart sum on Amazon still outperform, but he knocks a price target on Amazon down from 170, I think, to 145 there, and it's just on a little bit of dampening of the consumer. So, John, we're going to see that. When is J.P. Morgan? Is it tomorrow? J.P. Morgan tomorrow. Morgan tomorrow, Stanley okay. Too. So we're going into that. But I would just suggest that the inflation data, it's really important. And all of a sudden, we're focusing three inflation reports out to September 21. That has my attention. You mentioned Amazon. Let me pick up on Apple. We've seen a series of price target cuts there as well. Yeah. This from Jim Suver of City, Lisa, who had this to say. We've made changes to our estimates to reflect supply chain constraints, worsening consumer spending woes affecting broader device demand. Price target's still pretty punchy at 175. It's down from 200. So there's some serious upside there. But you're just starting to see those cuts come in ahead of earnings later this month. The fact that the cuts are coming from the behemoths, the rock solids, the ones with fortress cash balance sheets, shows the concern yeah. out there of what the effect could be. The Google example, Google traditionally hasn't been affected by some of the consumer economic <clears throat> cycles as other right. companies. So the fact that they're coming out and paring back some of their hiring plans tells you John, a lot. Can I be optimistic, John? Please be. Goldman Sachs, lower recession probability in your United Kingdom. I'm sorry, the numbers really weren't all that bad. They weren't that bad, but did you see what everyone started to price for the Bank of England, Tom? Yeah, they started I, to call well, for 50 basis green light points. up, they go. I mean, yeah. I get it. But I, I'm just suggesting, as you started the show on, there's a stew of data out there, both optimistic and pessimistic, and we'll see. Are you constructive on the single currency, on the euro? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to go all the Mundell on you. I don't know about the euro. I'm looking. I'm, I'm still focused on EM, which I get is a sideshow. But the fact is, EM is unraveling. I come in every single morning, Bramo, on the Bloomberg terminal on Tom's desk. It's just a chart of euro dollar. It's just waiting for that line in the sand. Yeah. It's all he's focused line on. Line in the sand. 
He right doesn't now. even it's like down ten thousand. I know he doesn't. Futures down or up rather by two tenths of one percent on the S and P on the Nasdaq up by a third of one percent. I'll give you a Dow quote, Tom. Go on, please. No, I, I just think I just think it's it's just important here to understand the line in the sand. You sound like George Bush Senior here. Let's be you know, come on, John. Let's be honest here. Uh, with the Dow up fifty nine points on futures, we got to understand the EUR parity. It's just like Dow ten thousand. Without a doubt, one zero zero four zero. TK has the hat already made. We're unchanged on euro dollar going into this. Yields in a little bit down a basis <laughs> point two ninety five fifty eight. The one thing we haven't discussed so far this morning, Bramo crude got absolutely hammered yesterday. WTI 96.59. The difference between the people who are fundamentally analyzing supply and demand and the idea that frankly supply is not going to meet demand in the oil market and then what you're seeing in the price action that divergence is really notable considering the fact that oil has come in as much as it has. 8.30 a.m. we're all talking about it. The U.S. June CPI numbers come out. People will be talking about the headline figure the estimate of 8.8 percent. Deutsche Bank saying 9 percent even uh, versus the core which is Expected to come in a little bit. I'm watching real wages. How much do we see an ongoing deterioration in the negative real wage experience of the average American? How much is this going to be what guides the outlook for the Federal Reserve and for policymakers in general? Because this is the dampening effect on growth from inflation, regardless of where it comes from and how it's going to really ease off. At 10 a.m., in terms of central bank responses to it, the Bank of Canada is meeting. They have been actually a bellwether in terms of what central banks are thinking. The expectation is for 75 basis points, bringing it to a two and a quarter percent uh, rate, uh, overnight rate. However, some people are expecting a 100 basis point move. And this follows the Bank of Korea's record 50 basis point move overnight and also the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's 75 basis point rate hike, or I believe 50 basis point rate hike, but there's a speculation that they could go further. How much is this really pushing the Fed toward being more aggressive no matter what? And at 2 p.m. we get the Fed beige book. This is also something that Tom watches very closely for the tea leaves of the American economy. I, however, want to know what the influence will be on gas because we have seen gas prices roll over a little bit, giving a little bit of relief. How much is that really stemming from a lack of demand versus other issues, including perhaps a bit more in terms of the refineries and the activity there, John? Bramo, thank you. Your day ahead with Lisa. Lisa, thank you very much. Steve Sosnick joining us now, Chief Strategist at Interactive Brokers. Steve, let's start here. CPI inflation data, a couple of hours away. What are you looking for? Well, I'm not going to diverge too much from the consensus. I think we'll, we'll you know, 8.9 seems like a good enough place for me to start. Um, I think you were hit, you were hitting on it earlier that the question will be if the number is not if the number is not what we expect, what what will the reaction be? Will will people freak if it's if it's even a tenth above? They might, um, you know, but because people are so on edge. Also, the other question becomes, you know, when we get into the core, um, you know, we're starting to see some of the food and energy prices, at least very, very short term. Yesterday, they rolled over a little bit. That's way too early to affect the numbers that we're going to see today. But how does that start to come out right. and how does that start to impact people? Steve, I love your note where you talk about the, that venting that's going on and the inflation rhetoric. The reality is all American Airlines view yesterday of, I believe it was 12% revenue growth, the inflation rhetoric folds over to a better than good revenue line for companies. Is that what we're missing as we look to the earnings season? What we're going to, what I think for earnings season is which companies will be able to, to pass it along, which companies are just going to have to eat it in terms of lower margins. Um, you know, right now we know the demand for travel is great. And so American Airlines is, has been, you know, has been a beneficiary of that. Uh, we'll hear from Delta in, in a little bit um, how, they're, how they're benefiting. But there's so many other companies that are not going to be able to pass this along between that and the strong, between, you know, that margin pressure and between um, stronger dollar on multinationals. There's going to be a lot of divergence during earnings season in terms of which companies can handle it and which companies are just going to have to report worse results or worse outlooks uh, as we go forward. Just quickly here, Steve, on CPI Wednesday, heading into JP Morgan Thursday and then University of Michigan Friday, which is going to be the most important data point of the week? Um, I, it still has to be CPI. If I'm going to rank them, I'm going to say CPI, Michigan, and JP Morgan as a, a, a laggard third. Um, I'm not... I, I wrote something yesterday. I really wish we could rearrange earnings season. I, I don't love the banks as being the the bellwether because they're such they're so fluky and idiosyncratic. Yes. Um, and you know what does J P Morgan's trading numbers tell you about the rest of earnings season? 
Zero. I hate the arc of earnings season two. Steve, I'm so pleased you said that. Sure. Steve Sotnick <laughs> of Interactive Brokers. How much did you pay him? <laughs> I, nothing. We've never talked about it before. No, I, no, hate, I is, hate it too. I this, hate it too. And John, what's important here is they do it correctly in the United Kingdom. The hyster this is important, John. I remember when earnings season was the back page of the Wall Street Journal, three lines, revenue, operating income, net income, and you looked at the boxes and you had a felt thing in your hand and you circled the five or six that mattered, and then you looked up value line to try to get smarter before you read the street research. John, it came printed, not in PDF. And, and the fact is, John, England does this better than the media hysteria here venting about four or five big banks. I had this conversation with Stuart Kaiser at UBS in the last couple of days and I actually asked him, given the arc of earnings season, how are you going to trade this? Because you know what comes first, the banks do, then tech comes a little bit later. And further down the line is the retailers. And Lisa, we're trying to get a decent read on the consumer right now. And the retailers are an <clears throat> important part, an important part of that puzzle. Yeah, but it depends on whether they're buying clothes or whether they're buying Pepsi products, evidently, as we heard yesterday from PepsiCo. The idea that demand there is really picking up and they're able to pass exactly. along and then yeah. some of the inflationary pressures versus clothes that people have already bought a lot of, particularly the stay-at-home brands and companies that have already built up their inventories well, I, of yoga pants when people actually want real pants to go back to work. Real, well, yes, yes, we do want real that pants. That felt personal. Yoga pants. That really did. John, she's, she's hey, watch it, John. She must be planning another vacation. John, you and I I can't remember, we were on our third or fourth gin and tang, and I can't remember, but what matters to me, I want to know what Home Depot's doing. Yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. I think we should lead with the tech names, personally. Well, lead yeah, with the big sure. weightings I mean, on the yeah, S&P, yeah, let's yeah, get absolutely. those earnings done. That, that's far too, good. yeah. Your vote has been submitted. Thank you. <laughs> Not that my voice on this counts for anything. Future's up two tenths. It is CPI Wednesday, TK super excited. On a beautiful I hate morning when you say that, John. in New York City. <laughs> Jesus. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Numbers out today will show that inflation in the U.S. likely hit another four decade high last month, according to the median forecast. In a Bloomberg survey, the Consumer Price Index probably rose 8.8% from a year ago. That would be the largest jump since 1981, and it would keep the Federal Reserve on track for another big interest rate hike this month. The CPI is out 8.30 a.m. New York time. President Biden's problems at home are looming over a Middle East trip that's all about oil. The president arrives today in Israel, the first stop on his journey. It's the visit to Saudi Arabia that's seen as crucial. The hope is that restoring relations with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman will secure a boost in oil production and help ease gasoline prices, but a deal is far from a given. And in the UK, Rishi Sunak heads a final list of eight candidates seeking to become the next Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister. Sunak's resignation last week helped trigger Boris Johnson's downfall. Today will be the first round of balloting amongst Tory MPs. The candidate with the least support is knocked out, along with anyone receiving fewer than 30 votes. Twitter has now sued Elon Musk over his abandoned $44 billion takeover bid in a suit filed in Delaware lawyers accused the world's richest man of having buyer's remorse after his fortune declined. Musk scrapped the deal over concerns about fake accounts. And Google plans to slow hiring for the rest of the year. In an email to staff, Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai noted the possibility of a recession and urged the company to be more entrepreneurial and work with greater urgency. He said Google will focus on hiring engineering, technical and other critical roles. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We're engaged in a very challenging exercise, which is um, to try to cool the economy down to normal levels, right, in an effort to bring inflation out of, under control, but without the intent of trying to cool it so down that, that, that the decline is calamitous. The right policy is to get inflation under control, period. Thread in the needle. Thomas Bach in there, the Richmond Fed president at the Rotary Club of Charlotte from New York City this morning. Good morning. Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive two tenths of 1% mm. on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, up a third of 1%. It's CPI Wednesday. TK, so excited. Don't Yields lower going. by a basis point. 295.39 on a 10 It's CPI Wednesday. Tomorrow is Carlos Rodin Thursday. He's up against the Brewers. 
the great pitcher of the San Francisco Giants. John, this is a throwback. I'm sure there's somebody in English football like this. This guy is from another time and place. He picks up the pebble and throws it at home plate as hard as he can. Is Carlos excited about you, Mitch, Friday? No, no he you didn't go to Michigan. He's he not that be. kind of guy. He's just trying to watch guy. him up. And it's John, are you aware, are, John, are you aware on the commercial break, Bramo's writing an auction newsletter? I'm, I'm very aware of it. I just it's, received it's like it. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Sent it out to Bloomberg <laughs> clients. It's like, no. uh, well, someone asked me. They said, why didn't you mention the 30-year okay, auction? Moment. Quick, you've got 20 seconds okay, before so we get to AMH. Said, go on. Okay, so someone said, why didn't you talk about it? 1 p.m. today, you get a 30-year auction of treasuries. And I always talk about them. And Tom always denigrates them and says he's asleep. And I didn't mention it because the other things going on and because I didn't want to repeat that conversation. But it is really interesting because the 10-year auction yesterday went worse than expected at a time when people are piling into duration as the conviction uh, trade right now. So does this indicate that this perhaps doesn't have as much real money behind it as it does trading activity in a pretty illiquid market right now relative to yep. history because you have seen trading volumes come down a lot? That was my 20-second <clears throat> brief. Totally agree. Can someone wake up, Tom? Anyone on the studio floor in there? TK is still with us. Yeah, I've had the Good. morning tang. I'm ready to go. I'm excited about CPI Wednesday right now. Stick joining door. us from Jerusalem, she is just down the street from the pink limestone of the King David Hotel. Amory Horden uh, 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 joins us. Amory, the president is en route. What is his number one goal as he visits Israel on this historic trip? Well, Israel is really a stopover to what his number one goal is, which is going to be in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And that's, of course, to meet with Gulf leaders, especially the Saudis and the UAE are the two countries that have this spare capacity for oil to help him at home. But of course, here in Israel, he is going to want to make sure that he is discussing with leaders. It's going to be, though, um, an interesting meeting because the Israelis right now don't have a government. It recently collapsed. They're looking forward to elections in November. So he'll be in the hands of a caretaker prime minister, Yair Lapid. But really, it's about getting the Israelis to normalize with more Arab countries, to really expand upon the Abraham Accords that happened during the Trump administration. And this is a place that he can stop and begin right. those conversations. And then when he goes to Saudi, he'll be the first U.S. president to actually fly directly from Israel to Saudi Arabia, potentially uh, this could be foreshadowing something that we could happen in Saudi Arabia, which is more Israeli flights being able to use oh. Saudi airspace. But, Amory, this is not James Earl Carter and Anwar Sadat. There's some real nuances here as well. Subdivide, give us a little clinic on the response of the different Arab nations and tribes to Israel. Who is most amenable to Israel? Well, it's those countries that normalized. It's Bahrain. It's United Arab Emirates. I would say the UAE particularly. You're seeing direct flights from Tel Aviv to Dubai. There's a ton of talk of it. Even just everyday people talking about the fact that they can now go to the Emirates and likewise Emiratis being able to come here in Israel. And there's huge business opportunities between these two countries. But the biggest economy, of course, in the in the Gulf and in the Middle East is Saudi Arabia and that leader of the GCC. And this would be the country that especially the Biden administration would love to see this normalization of ties. But Saudi Arabia has made this policy uh, very, uh, uh, very emphatically saying that they will not normalize with Israel officially until there is a two state solution. Um, but you do see a lot more cooperation between these two countries. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have one serious common enemy, and that is Iran. Well, meanwhile, I'm wondering how amenable the Middle East is going to be to responding to the U.S. demand for more oil and more playing ball with them in terms of isolating Russia. And I say this as there is a little observed article talking about how flows from Russia to the Middle East have been increasing of crude steadily throughout the year, a sort of untraditional relationship where the Middle East is trying to capitalize on the cheaper prices from Russia and the step back from Europe and the United States. How much clout does the U.S. really have to affect the Middle East and their approach to oil. 
Well, we should first by saying that the Middle East at the moment doesn't have a ton of spare capacity. It is two countries we are talking about, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And together, it's a little bit under three million barrels a day. Yes, there's that report that there are Russian oil coming into the Middle East. Very hard to track the exact barrels and where they're going. That Russian oil getting mixed in with some of the Middle East crude. Where does those products go? Very hard to track exactly. But that does seem to potentially be easing some of the pressure on the Middle East and maybe these kingdom and the kingdom and the emirates which can acquiesce the president's call um, but this is only one part of biden's problem when it comes to the energy market the other is of course spare capacity um, refining capacity and the spare capacity for that is in china so this could potentially help him a little bit at home we saw opec plus nations give a nod to that at the last meeting um, Everyone thinks they could potentially backfill some of these countries that are not meeting their quotas, like Angola or Nigeria. But it's not as though this trip to the kingdom is going to solve his gasoline problem before the November elections. Amory, brilliant. Looking forward to the coverage for the week. Amory Hordern there. Over in Israel, TK, to Lisa's point, as we build out this trip through the week, we head towards Saudi Arabia and gas is going to be a massive focus for a lot of people in this market. Gasoline prices have been coming in, but maybe a little bit too late to affect today's CPI print, Tom. But going forward from here, can we start to see some of that hopefully well, yeah. fade out, you fade can, away? Yes, you can see it on the Bloomberg screen, and I would use copper as a major proxy for this. It's not just about hydrocarbons, but yes, politically for President Biden, it is front and center about a gallon of gas, and everybody I'm talking Talking to the Bentley's in the garage. I've got a driver in, and John, um, you know, I'm sorry, it's come in what 10, 12, 15 days in a row. 40% of course CPI. Let's talk about that. Lisa, you've been on top of it every single month. It's rents, and rents could be the component that maybe we're surprised by again. And that's the worry that that hangs around, that lives beyond the crude gas story and sticks with us through year end. And that's going to keep the Fed on course to hike more. There are predictions that the rents are going to reaccelerate. Rent inflation is going to reaccelerate heading into the fall, offsetting some of the decline that we've seen in gas prices. That's one worry. The other worry is that people are still spending. And this really speaks to the idea that perhaps gas prices are rolling over. But is demand really rolling over or is it other issues? And yeah. that, I think, is really a key point. Deutsche Bank came out early with a recession call for next year. They've had to bring that in. Peter Hooper at Deutsche Bank is going to be joining us very shortly. Futures up 210 of 1% on the S&P. Inflation data in CPI America. Wednesday. You said it two hours away. This is Bloomberg. This CPI Wednesday, according to Tom Keane. Futures are positive on the S&P 500, up a tenth of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, up two tenths of 1%. Really choppy price action going into the data point a little bit later this morning. After this morning, it's on to earnings. And then, according to Lisa, it's you, Mitch, Friday. In the bond market, twos, tens and thirties look a little something like this. Yields come back in by a basis point, 295.21. I'll catch up with Priya Misra of TD a little bit later this morning after the number. She thinks that this two-year yield is worth shorting, worth short in the two-year, looking for a higher two-year yield, and she is looking for Fed funds to get out to 4%. After I catch up with Priya, I'll catch up with Michael Gapen, who's now at Bank of America. He's looking for a recession this year in America. How do those two calls collide? In the FX market, things look like this. A 50 basis point move from New Zealand over in the UK, an upside surprise on GDP, perhaps teeing up a 50 basis point move over at the Bank of England. And for the ECB next week, Tom, that's the one I'm not sure about with the ECB. What does a rate hike over at the ECB actually achieve? given that all of Europe's problems right well, now... where are we on fragmentation? ...are off the back of what's happening in the energy market. Where are we on fragmentation, I've, and, As far as I understand, Tom, we've got a name. I, I don't know what the tool looks like. There's going to be pressure on them to unveil that next week, too. That news conference is going to be fascinating. What a tough spot for this ECB president to be in. Yeah, well, you've been in the news conference. What is different about Frankfurt versus London or Washington? What is I the think difference? There's some similarities there? between the ECB and the Bank of England. Sometimes it can get a bit punchy over at the Bank of England. I expect the ECB, you get a range of questions from different parts of Europe, Tom. Right. And there's a feeling this time around under this president that perhaps the Hawks are a little bit more in the driving seat and they can yeah, get okay. what they want through summer. I, I don't know about that. 
Tom. I think that okay. for this ECB, they face a massive challenge, and it's a challenge that President Draghi didn't face. I mean, I mean, Draghi what? faced massive downside risk to growth. On inflation, he had the capacity just to keep on pushing through the kitchen sink, go max dovish. There's a different story right. for this ECB president. I mean, if you and I went to Frankfurt, it's, it's a, like a three-hour lunch, right? If you can find a restaurant. Yeah. I'm told that apparently there are some good ones, but Tom, when you really? and I go, would, would, we I can know. We'll never find them. Joining us right now on CPI Wednesday, a phrase he hates as much as I do, Peter Hooper joins us, the esteemed global head of economic research at Deutsche Bank Securities, and I'm proud to say Matt Lazzetti is his fault. He joins us from up by the Canadian border in the leafy green. For those of you on radio, Hooper ensconced in what you wear now in the wilds. We booked Peter Hooper today because the deer flies there are larger than they are in Tupper Lake where Lisa's going uh, this weekend. Dr. Hooper, thank you so much uh, for joining us. You have written that this inflation is the challenge of the decade. How do we meet the challenge of this high inflation? Tom, uh, delighted to be with you. Thanks very much on this uh, very important day indeed. Um, so this, this, this challenge is, is going to be with us for some time, given the extent to which uh, inflation is becoming ingrained in the labor market, uh, increasingly in expectations. It's going to be a struggle. Uh, fortunately, the Fed has uh, made a major about turn in, in uh, recent months. Uh, it's, it's tough to, to turn this tanker, but uh, uh, Jay Powell has proved nimble. Uh, and I think the aggressive uh, stance of policy, another 75 coming up this month, uh, uh, we're, we're, going, we're going to see uh, uh, a Fed that gets back to neutral, certainly, uh, and likely slightly into positive real terms, at least by, uh, by, by early next year on the Fed funds rate. That, we think, should be enough to begin to take some of the steam out of the labor market uh, and eventually get us into recession. Our call has been uh, Matt, Matt and team have upgraded their call to uh, a recession by the middle of next year, but recognizing fully that uh, risks are, 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 are something happening a, a bit sooner. But there's no question right. there's going to have to be some pain here to deal with the problem. What is the dynamic of inflation up, sideways, down between goods and services? Uh, we're seeing a, a pretty, pretty uh, interesting shift right now. Certainly, goods inflation is is declining. Uh, we, we are seeing gasoline prices beginning. I mean, oil prices will come off. Gasoline prices will be falling a bit further. Food prices eventually uh, coming down, and and uh, core goods uh, have been decelerating. Uh, no question. Uh, but services, which is two thirds of the economy, uh, are continue to continue to accelerate. Uh, we're, we're now up uh, close to 5% and, and, and rising on rental inflation. Uh, you were mentioning this earlier. I, I think uh, that's going to be with us certainly this year. Uh, and if you look beyond the, the, the CP, important CPI today, to the PCE, which the Fed is really focused on, uh, waiting in the background is a huge increase coming in medical cost inflation. That's been very low. Uh, we have a, a big gap between PCE and CPI because of medical cost inflation. It's high in CPI, it's low in the PCE. But that's going to be a problem coming over the next year, certainly, as wage inflation uh, in the healthcare sector begins to push things along there. Peter, so, the, yes. the consumer Sorry. demand is still there. I, I want to pick up on that point. And you're seeing that, and you're seeing this inflationary pressure continuing. And yet you're bringing forward your recession expectations. How much is that driven? by almost an artificial cap to supplies. And I think about this, for example, with the airline industry, with Delta just coming out, talking about capacity, remaining below uh, where it was expected to be at a time when they don't have the staff to really fill some of the, uh, the positions and get these planes off the ground. We saw that with Heathrow. How much is that going to really cause a downdraft to the economy? Well, Lisa, no question that in some sectors, supply is still a major factor holding back spending. I mean, autos, uh, uh, it's, it's, according to Michigan survey, it's one of the worst times to, possible to buy an auto right now. But uh, we expect sales to continue pretty strong because we're catching up because of the supply problems. Same in airfares, uh, airlines. Uh, but but my, my colleague, uh, you know, member of Matt's team, uh, Justin Widener, put out a very interesting piece yesterday that updates analysis of demand versus supply as a factor driving inflation. Uh, last year, it was largely supply. Now it's two-thirds demand. Uh, he does a very careful analysis looking at, you know, 
in categories where both supply and demand is going up, that's a demand-driven increase. And we're seeing that predominantly now. So, yes, the economy is showing some early signs of slowing. We're nowhere near a recession given the labor, given the labor market. But demand is still the major problem right now in inflation. And this is what I think will keep the Fed going. Peter, this to me is the big issue with calling for a recession by the end of this year, or the first quarter next year, rather than the end of next year, as you originally said back in April. How do we get from demand that is super hot and people who are very much willing to spend to recession? Well, you're, you're, you're certainly seeing it in some sectors now. Housing, we expect housing to have fallen 10 percent annual rate in the second quarter because of the big increase in, in mortgage rates, because of the big increase in prices, the affordability is way off. People are moving into rentals and that's gonna push inflation up there. But housing sector is weak already. Uh, we expect to begin to see by the first half of next year, some drop off in, in business investment spending as, as uh, financial conditions continue to worsen. Right. Uh, and, and, and you're already seeing, I mean, consumer confidence is, is, is pressing uh, uh, decade lows here, right? That eventually is going to come through uh, and begin right. to fi uh, uh, hit, hit consumer spending. So we expect right. that certainly by the middle of next year, if not sooner. Peter, I've got a segue here away from CPI Wednesday and ask you about your colleague David Fulkert's Landau's strong statement the end of February that strong dollar would haunt us sooner rather than later. Dr. Fulkert's Landau was absolutely dead on. Now we have a strong dollar. What is a Deutsche Bank view of how we will solve the strong dollar matter? Well, I think I think the strong dollar is going to take care of itself here. It, it is playing a very important, and David has been obviously prescient on a number of fronts here lately, the strong dollar being one. But this is feeding in critically into giving us this tightening of financial conditions that's going to give us a downturn. As the U.S. goes into a, a, a deeper recession next year than we anticipate seeing in Europe, uh, I think you're going to see a turn. Uh, the, the, Fed, the Fed will, uh, as uh, unemployment rates uh, go up enough, and we expect to, to have to see at least a couple percentage points increase in the unemployment rate, the Fed's eventually going to begin to turn. Uh, not getting back to zero, but maybe getting back to something closer to neutral uh, on Fed funds. And as that occurs, uh, I think the dollar will begin to, uh, to, to reverse. Peter, it's just awesome to catch up with you. It's been too long. Peter Hooper there of Deutsche Bank Securities. Tom, on the path forward, and that road forward in this economy includes a recession for the team at Deutsche Bank. They're all linked, and that's been the real story here, John. I'll be honest, John, this Wednesday feels like a Friday to me. I don't know why that that is, but in this extended week that we're in, John, the number one thing for me is how the correlations have picked up. Even the UK, the UK better than good. You got a little bit of a bid to Sterling, uh, 119.11 uh, right now, but the correlation are there, and we're going to see those correlations work at 831. And let's pick up on down to airlines as well and go through some of these yeah. numbers. So revenue basically in line for the second quarter. Earnings a miss comes in at 144. The estimate was 164. Clearly there's a cost issue at play here, Lisa. Fuel front and center, obviously. The outlook for the third quarter, actually pretty decent, seeing total revenue somewhere between 12.6 billion to 13.1. The estimate was 12.5, so up about 1.35%. There is a cost issue, there is a reliability issue. That's something all these airlines have to face right now. The reliability issue is the 4,000 canceled flights by Delta over the past couple of months to deal with capacity issues and staffing issues and a whole host of other uh, challenges facing the company. This is an industry that can charge what it wants. It can pass along mm. the cost to consumers. And even in the data, yes, they miss their earnings marginally. But if you take a look at the projections, they expect to continue being able to pass along these costs, even as they keep capacity below where it was in 2019. That is the story. Of John. those several thousand canceled flights, would you like to talk about one of them? No, I'm good. No, I think everyone good? doesn't okay. need to hear about my trip to okay. Atlanta. Just, just wondering. It was Ed great. Bastian has this to say. We've great got to city. do everything we can, and we have been, to ensure that we serve the demand and serve the quality of the operation and not try to grow beyond our means, which is tempting to do when you see this level of demand. Futures up a little more than a tenth of 1% on ESP from a beautiful New York. This is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The International Monetary Fund cut its month-old growth projections for the U.S. economy this year and next. It now says GDP will rise 2.3% in 2022, down from 2.9%. The IMF also raised its jobless rate forecast through 2025. It warned that a broad-based surge in inflation poses systematic risks to both the U.S. and the global economy. The latest inflation figures are out today, 8.30 a.m. New York time. The International Energy Agency warns that oil prices pose a high risk to the global economy. It says there are signs that fuel costs are starting to hurt demand growth. The IEA trimmed forecasts for oil consumption this year and next. Still, it says the demand weakness is being offset by tightening supply. On a chaotic day in Sri Lanka, where a state of emergency was declared after President Gotabaya Rajapaska fled the country. Protesters gathered outside the presidential palace and later seized the state-run broadcaster, forcing it to go off the air. Sri Lanka is bankrupt, partly due to Rajapaska's policies. Inflation is running at 70% and there is a shortage of food, fuel and medicine. Bloomberg's learned the new U.S. owners of London's Chelsea Football Club have run into a potential tax liability. It has to do with luxury cars the team gave its players in recent years when it was owned by Russian businessman Roman Abramovich. Bidders for Chelsea learned about the issue during the sale process. They were told British tax authorities are investigating. And a quarter of Americans say their next car will be an electric vehicle. According to a survey by the American Automobile Association, more than three-fourths of them say that their interest is driven by desire to save on fuel costs. Last year, only 3.2% of U.S. vehicles were EVs. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We could absolutely see fuel crises around the globe. And, uh, you know, part of that is due to historically low investment in fossil fuels. And, uh, you know, that, that trend is not really reversing itself at any point. And this is uh, precipitating a, a huge energy crisis. That was Ellen Wald, the senior fellow at the Atlantic Council from New York City this morning. Good morning, Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Ferro. Just an hour and about 42 minutes away from CPI in America. Going into that, futures positive, two tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, up around about a third of 1%. Yields come in a couple of basis points, 294.84. A lot of you looking at crude. Collapse lower yesterday. What a move. We're positive eight tenths of one percent. A small bounce. Ninety six sixty. Take your pick, Tom. Global I slowdown. Think China in the list alongside everything yeah. else right now. And again, China, we've underplayed this week. What's the update there? The answer is this new variant. It's important, maybe not deaths, but hospitalizations. A record trade surplus. Exports surging. Guess what happened to imports? They weakened one percent. Okay. That gives you a picture of what's happening with the Chinese economy at the moment, Tom. Well, they again, opened the doors and allowed the exports to go out, but the demand for imports clearly not there in a big way. Yeah, and again, on global slowdown, we'll have to see here as everybody readjusts off the inflation report here in less than two hours. Right now, we wanted to do this, which is get a snapshot of the German people and how they will react to the tumult that is on the Bloomberg screen. Liana Fix is expert at this. To say she's program director with her work at London School of Economics. She's at the Korber Foundation uh, in Germany and truly an expert on what the German people do. Liana, thank you so much for joining us. In Absolutely. Hamburg, in January, the low is 31 degrees Fahrenheit. In February, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. In March, 36 degrees Fahrenheit. What will the people of Hamburg do this coming cold winter? Well, I think you're very right to say that there's a lot of um, uncertainty and a lot of fear among the German public, not only about the prices, about the energy prices that will um, that are rising, about um, payments that they will have to make at the end of the year that might be twofold, threefold, fourfold as much as they've paid in the past, but there's also a concern whether there will actually be parts of the population that will not be able to warm the households, especially the news that some communities are preparing centers where you can meet to keep yourself warm has sent some quite some shock waves through Germany. So it's uh, something which is um, observed very closely for Moscow, obviously, and we see how Moscow tries to play this game right. and to create even more fear among the German, but also among some of the European public. In your research note, 
You say that Mr. Putin works from fear. Can he bluff here? I mean, what is the level of bluff? What is the level of the input of fear that Mr. Putin will do? Well, he has a short-term advantage because the increase in gas prices leads to the surprising effect that Russia gets as uh, gets revenues from gas as much as it needs and even more than before. Although we do have an oil oil sanctions from the European Union that will kick in at the end um, of the year, but at the moment Russia can afford to reduce the supplies for Europe. And at the same time, it gets enough revenues to sustain its own state budget. Um, this will change in the medium to long term. But at the moment, this really gives Russia the opportunity to uh, put pressure on Germany and on Europe. And um, we will probably see that the Nord Stream 1 pipeline um, will not return to its previous um, supplies and capacities, but will probably be slowly um, reduced by, by Moscow. Yeah, you know, one of the parlor games right now on Wall Street is trying to figure out what the implications would be should the pipeline get shut off in entirety versus 50% capacity resumed, et cetera, yeah. and all of these potential outcomes. From your perspective, how quickly is Germany moving to really replace those gas supplies? How quickly could they be independent of Russia gas in the face of some of these huge economic concerns that people are projecting in? We've seen that Germany has moved quite quickly when it came to Russian oil. Surprisingly to everyone, Germany agreed to oil sanctions that will come at the end of the year. But gas is more difficult. So there are a lot of attempts to get LNG gas, to construct LNG terminals, because Germany didn't have any before. It was so dependent on, on cheap Russian gas coming through the pipelines. There are travels to Qatar and to other countries, but this will not be enough. So in case the Nord Stream 1 pipeline will be shut down entirely, which is probably not as likely as a slow decrease from the Russian side, because then they will still get revenues from the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. But if that continues, um, Germany will have to reduce its gas consumption quite significantly, the estimates of um, between 20 and 30 percent of reductions. And this will obviously be a challenge. And it needs to start now in the summer, not in the winter, because we need yeah. already now in the summer those efforts to fill the storage. We've heard that a lot over the last few weeks, Leanne. It was great to catch up. Leanna Fix there at the Corba Foundation. It's shut down for maintenance, Nord Stream 1, on Monday. It will be closed for 10 days. And I've seen people, particularly here at Bloomberg, ask the question, Tom, what's the most important event for Europe next week? Is it a first hike since 2011 for the European Central Bank? Or what happens when Nord Stream 1 comes back online? How much gas actually flows through that? Oh. Now, if you asked an FX strategist right now what the most important thing was, I think they'd point you towards what is happening with gas through yeah, this year and, and into winter. Our Will Kennedy was very good on this yesterday, John, on one of my other properties. And the basic idea here is it's not a pipeline turned on and off or marginally on and off. It's literally Mr. Putin with a burst of gas and then it shuts down and then he reopens it again where he's almost playing games with them. Open, close, open, close, open, close. Well, Gazprom have already cut back, throttled back the supply through that pipeline going into this. Anyway, Lisa, it makes you wonder how relevant rates actually are to where the euro trades, given that so much of this is about what happens with Russia and what happens with gas. Yeah, and how does the ECB respond to gas prices, right? Do they say, yeah, that's the first screen we look at every morning and we adjust our expectations for how much we're going to raise rates dependent on that. At the same time, this is hiking into weakness, and that is the theme across the world. Yeah. And that is just confirmed once again when you take a look at the inflation driven by those gas prices. And that on and off switch that Tom is talking about is going to inject a premium into so many things and, and a higher inflationary inputs, regardless of whether Russia puts the gas back on, that I think that people are trying to game that out as well. Just getting this from Jen Jacobs, a White House reporter for Bloomberg News. The president will meet with the Saudi Crown Prince MBS Mohammed bin Salman on Friday evening. Jake Sullivan, his national security advisor, saying that during the gaggle on Air Force One on the way to the Middle East, Tom. So there's one for you. That from Jen Jacobs just uh, moments ago. Our Anne-Marie Horton there after Bavaria, after Madrid as well, a president with a bit of domestic rest. That's a joke. He did not rest, I don't believe, given the news flow. But here he is again, John International. And, of course, Anne-Marie making very clear the Saudi meetings wrapped around Iran as the combined force here yep. will be the focus. There's so much to discuss and so yep. much happening 
this week. Inflation data coming up in about an hour and 35 minutes. More economic data coming up on Friday. University of Michigan sentiment. Tom's thrilled. Retail sales, some bank earnings, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, take your pick. Futures up a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Euro dollar basically at parity at 10063. You've seen some of the memes about Americans going to Europe and living like kings. You should search well, for them. I don't them, know Tom. if they're living like they're kings. You know. They are. <laughs>it is CPI Wednesday from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures up two tenths of 1%. TK, the data, 90 minutes away. Yeah, the data that we're seeing on the screen right now is pretty stasis, waiting for that important headline data. And yeah, you go beneath the headline numbers, but there's really only two numbers, John. There's the top line inflation and that core number. I guess the adults at the Fed are worried about the core statistic. Our listeners, our viewers, they're worried about top-line inflation. We're all focused on the compositional shift, Tom. If the gas story fades, do we see a continued pickup in rents? Mohamed Al Aaron's asked this question over the last week repeatedly. How sticky will the story be? Away from nine, eight, seven, six. Do we have to live with five, four, three? And Tom, for how long? Well, I've said this. Where's the kink point where you come down, you come down with some alacrity, and then you get to a point, then what? My amateur guesstimate is 5% as a point, and then from there you go down to whatever the new 2% is. Is it back to 2%? Powell has to say that, or is it an Adam Posen 3%? Lisa, are we now done for 75 month end of this Fed? I think that that's basically what's baked into the market right now. There are some people who are saying it's more prudent to do 50 basis points. You could have that argument, but it seems like right now in the market it's baked in for 75 basis points. But picking up on where we end the year on inflation, I want to just go back to what Sanal Desai of Franklin Templeton said. She is expecting 7.5 to 8% inflation headline CPI at the end yeah. of this year. What kind of moves does the Fed have to make in that case? How quickly do they have to move, even if you do see some of the underlying components rolling over? She said it was too early to bet against inflation, too early to price in rate cuts. Priya Misra of TD is going to join me a little bit later this morning. We've caught up with her a few times over the last week, Lisa. She's still looking for 4% on Fed funds. I'm not sure this market is quite there anymore in the way it was a few months ago. Which is the reason why I'm actually really interested to see some of the action at the longer end of the yield curve, the 10 years, the 30 years, given the 30-year auction today. How much demand is there? How much conviction around this duration trade is there in the face of inflation that may be stickier for longer and a Fed that perhaps doesn't have the conviction to raise rates in a Volcker-esque kind of way? We're all trying to read the C-suite tea leaves, aren't we? Yeah. What did we learn from Google? Not great. Things are going to be uh, softening up, and they're trying to gird uh, with it's a little bit like more this for the next hunger. Three weeks. We're going to be microanalyzing every single announcement, John. Tom, more hunger than we've shown on sunnier days. That's what uh, Google would like to see. Yeah, okay. You're not impressed by that? No, Is I mean, come on. We're, we're sub, let, let's begin with we're sub 2% real GDP. Hunger. GDP is lousy. We all get that. Global GDP is terrible. Sure. But will corporations adapt? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. What will fall to the bottom line? I think that's what it comes down to. We've seen that with, say, Delta Airlines this morning. Revenue mm -hmm. was in line, pretty decent. It was a profit that was the miss here, Lisa, and that was costs. Front and center, costs and execution. Well, and when you look at the costs, it's largely due to gas and it, to a lesser degree, salaries. So what gets cut and to how do the companies adapt? To Tom's point, companies will adapt, but how? With job cuts, with paring back some of their capital investment, how much of that is what really goes right. to the bottom line of the economy and what people feel in their pocketbooks? Futures right now, positive a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Let's whip through it on the NASDAQ 100, up a quarter of 1%. Yields look a little something like this, down two basis points on a 10-year to 294.65. In your FX market, you're Euro dollar, just a little bit of a stronger euro in the mix here. Euro dollar 10058. Have to keep going back to it though. Crude yesterday 
got hammered, slammed, lower, plunged, crude this morning. It's the smallest bounce right here, Lisa, up three quarters of one percent at 96.63. Just amazing to think that we were talking $120 yeah, exactly. a barrel 150. not so long ago. And how much does this really feed into the CPI print? 8.30 a.m. we get U.S. June CPI. This is what we're all talking about. It is CPI Wednesday, of course. Then we're going to be talking about the conversation around whether core is the most important data point for the market versus the headline figure expected to be around 8.8 percent, possibly with a nine handle. I'm watching real average hourly wages, which have turned deeply negative, the most negative. People are losing money on a relative basis based on inflation at the fastest pace. Going back to where this data set started at 2016, how much does that continue to deteriorate and force the Fed's hand? At 10 a.m., other central bank reactions. Bank of Canada will be meeting, possibly raising their rates by 75 basis points to 2.25 percent. How much do they act as a tea leaf for other central banks? The speculation is they could potentially uh, actually raise rates by a full percentage point. And at 2 p.m., the Fed Beige Book comes out. This is going to be really important. And I know that you're rolling your eyes, Tom. John, I know you're listening for how I'm going to justify talking about the Beige Book. What I want to see is the tea leaves in the underlying economy that speak to the demand for oil and gas. We've seen gas prices come off. People are hoping that will actually diminish the inflationary inputs over the next couple of months. How much is that driven by people actually driving less, traveling less? And how much is this driven simply by speculation and by refineries actually producing more? Lisa, thank you. I'm just entertained by you trying to convince that Tom should wake up to <laughs> have a look at something that you're looking at in the afternoon. Thank you. I appreciate it's a good effort. your appreciation of my effort. Ramo, thank you. Mona Mahajan joins us now, senior investment strategist at Edward Jones. Mona, is this going to be the one? I've got to ask someone this question. Will this be peak inflation in the United States of America at 8.30 Eastern time? You know, John, uh, the recent trends are indicating that, that that is a real possibility now. Maybe the elusive peak of infl inflation is upon us today at 8.30 a.m. You know, keep in mind when you look at the numbers for, for June, uh, oil and commodity prices, if you average the daily prices, uh, substantially higher than what they were in May. But of course, these first few days in July thus far, those same average prices are now trending much lower. So uh, if, and it's a big if, these trends continue, uh, headline inflation certainly should start to cool. Uh, in our view, core inflation already ticking downward, but will continue to have that downward trend right. driven by slower consumption, you know, cooling housing, and perhaps mm -hmm. even uh, lower wage gains. Well, let's forward. go uh, University of Pennsylvania Engineering and fall down to the x-axis and the partial derivative of the x-axis. How uncertain are you about how this unfolds out through this year and into next year? Yeah, you know, it, it has several different uh, paths of, of travel here. But generally, when you think about just um, the year-over-year -year comparisons, uh, based on that alone, we think headline inflation could, could fall to 6.5% by year-end. And then if you start putting in some of the underlying fundamentals around that, uh, we could see that number move even lower. So uh, to your point earlier on whether we get back to call it 2%, 3%, um, that's not likely to happen before 2023. Uh, and in our view, we, we do hover around that 2 to 3% range, which we do think the Fed will ultimately uh, accept as the new normal. Mona, you write that you don't see the same kind of scope for a deep, prolonged recession that some people are calling for. You think perhaps the bulk of the selling has already taken place in certain risk assets. What would you have to see to make you rethink that thesis? Yeah, you know, I think it all comes back to this inflation story. Uh, of course, if inflation remains stickier and, you know, we're cognizant that oil could be its own kind of animal here. It has its own supply demand dynamics, but also the pressure from the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, if we get a stickier inflation trend than what we're seeing or expecting, uh, that's really when we see the Fed and, and really central banks globally uh, keep that their foot on the, the pedal there and those aggressive rate hikes continue. That's not our base case here. And so, uh, in that scenario, if, if our base case plays out, uh, we don't see yet the scope for a deep or prolonged recession. Certainly, the labor market last week uh, showed us that we're really starting from a point of, of relative strength here in the U.S. economy. That will provide some cushion as we kind of try to absorb some of these aggressive rate hikes that are coming our way. Mona, there's an urge to start migrating, gravitating towards tech names. Is that a mistake? You know, I think it's still early to go full in on growth tech sectors. Um, you know, of course, during a period of, of rising rates and rising real yields, that value trade held up very well. And we saw value, but not only value, the defensive parts of the market. That's still, in our view, uh, working well here. Staples, healthcare, et cetera. Those names that, that are not only 
quote unquote recession proof, but also provide a little bit of an inflationary hedge. You know, we have to pay our utility bills, our health care needs have to be taken care of, our staples have to be consumed. And so uh, in this environment, we still think uh, that defensive and even value tilt makes sense as we get lower in the inflationary trends and as the Fed starts to, you know, maybe uh, move more gradually or put its foot off the brake somewhat, that's when we really think that that scope for uh, the more growth parts of the market, but keep in mind value growth and meaning quality growth, that's really when that starts, that trade starts to make more sense. Mona, thank you. Awesome to catch up. Mona Mahajan there of Edward Jones. Ahead of the CPI print in about an hour and 20 minutes, Mona looking for maybe a peak, but ultimately some sticker inflation down the road. On the gas front, the energy front there's been some relief over the last few weeks yeah. gasoline prices tom just continuing to come down hey. not in a material way but slowly slowly and that and add up i'm not used to 8.8 as a running number as a statistic but john right now if inflation went down to 5.8 percent would we really be any less miserable i don't think so no i don't think so either, i don't think tom. so if I we finish I the year at six Wow. Then this Fed's got more work to do, right? I'll say, yeah, more than more work to do. It's just I just wonder, Tom, what gets them to focus on the labor market? What would it be? Well, there's a lot of opinions. One is, John, the asymmetry of claims. And there's a school of thought that if claims spike up, that's an important as well. The unemployment rate, you got the raging debate of what we just saw, which on the surface was better than good labor. And underneath it, maybe not so good. I mean... I, I would say just the, the, the round number, the unemployment rate, is, is what gets your attention. That's why the corporate guidance, I think you can fold it into the economic data this week. Lisa, we'll be looking for things like what are your intentions for hiring? Think Google and what we've heard from them overnight. We'll be looking for those kind of tea leaves in the corporate earnings this week through the next couple of months. How high can the unemployment rate really go? A lot of people are speculating the Fed is really lowballing how high it has to go to reach their uh, 2 percent target on inflation, that they have to see some sort of material slowdown and pull back with respect to the balance sheets of households that still are allowing them to do all the traveling, to buy all the goods, to keep inflation hot. Michael Gapin has unemployment at 4.6 six percent after next year that's a one percentage point climb higher in the unemployment rate he's calling for a recession together with that move in unemployment and lisa maybe that starts to ramp up the pressure on this fed to think about other things and to be very clear none of us here want to see more people out of work this is an issue of a fed between a rock and a hard place without a doubt futures up two tenths of one percent on the s p from new york this morning good morning this is bloomberg Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, hit with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Numbers out today will show that inflation in the U.S. likely hit another four-decade high last month. According to the median forecast in a Bloomberg survey, the Consumer Price Index probably rose 8.8% from a year ago. That would be the largest jump since 1981, and it would keep the Federal Reserve on track for another big interest rate hike this month. The CPI is out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. President Biden's problems at home are looming over a Middle East trip that's all about oil. The president arrives today in Israel, the first stop on his journey. It's the visit to Saudi Arabia, though, that's seen as crucial. The hope is that restoring relations with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman will secure a boost in oil production and help ease gasoline prices. But a deal is far from given. In the UK, Rishi Sunak heads a final list of eight candidates seeking to become the next Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister. Sunak's resignation last week helped trigger Boris Johnson's downfall. Today will be the first round of balloting amongst Tory MPs. The candidate with the least support is knocked out, along with anyone receiving fewer than 30 votes. And the crisis in Sri Lanka is widening. Protesters took to the streets of Colombo after President Gotabaya Rajapaska fled the country for the Maldives. Demonstrators seized the state-run TV channel and forced it off the air. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's Prime Minister declared a state of emergency. Sri Lanka's economy has been hurt by soaring inflation and shortages of food, fuel and medicine. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. mild recession is being priced uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, a, a slightly deeper one in Europe. 
but I don't think the market is really poised for any significant or prolonged recession. Short and shallow, that seems to be the consensus. That was Peter Oppenheimer, the chief global equity strategist at Goldman Sachs from New York City this morning. Good morning. Here's your market. We are positive a third of 1% on the S&P, up 11. On the Nasdaq 100, up about four tenths of 1%. Yields come in a couple of basis points, 295.65. And do you want to call this a bounce after the mess of yesterday on crude, Tom? We're at 1%, uh, 96 I Eighty. Yeah, it's a good point, John, because I think the whole screen looks stasis here. Turkish lira unravels. Renminbi's got some stasis uh, to it. I, I just think there's a whole pause here, John. All in all, in equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, waiting for 8:30. Energy in focus, waiting for 8:30 yeah, with CPI. You know, then just, waiting for later this week yeah. too. Jake Sullivan, Tom, in the last 30 minutes or so, the president's national security advisor. Basically, telling us that the president will meet with the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman on Friday evening. Put that in the diary. It goes back to the Iran Iraq war, and it is UVAs, UAVs, excuse me, not University of Virginia, UAVs, which are drones. And the zeitgeist this morning, away from the president's trip and the diplomacy, is the fear of Iranian drones aiding Mr. Putin in Russia. Our Amory Horton is in Jerusalem, where this will be one of the topics. Amory, tie in the meet and greet, the photo ops, <clears throat> with the hardcore fear of these selected parties of Iran and their ability to take legitimate military technology from the iran Iraq war from 30, 40 years ago and bring it forward to aid Mr. Putin. Well, really, you have the Russian-Iranian ties incredibly strong, especially as Vladimir Putin, we do know, is continuing this war, which has now become a war of attrition, but is really locked out of dealing with a number of countries. So places like Iran, places potentially like China are going to be those avenues he is going to work with to try to secure some of these weapons. Um, that is one part and concern of this trip. And the president outlined this as well in his opinion piece in The Washington Post over the weekend, one of the reasons why he is saying saying in defense of his visit to Saudi Arabia, c considering the fact that there's many that is critical of his visit to the kingdom, is because they are trying to counter a Russia also in Iran that is not back in the nuclear agreement as well as China. Uh, but this in the region is a huge issue. And this is something that can, you have the uh, uh, Israelis and the Saudis coalesce around. And that is about a united front against Tehran. And Marie, as we hear about the potential meeting with Mohammed bin Salman, what is the potential political uh, fallout from this meeting, from this trip, given some of the concerns about human rights violations of uh, the crown prince? All eyes will be on this on this meeting. And this will go down in history books, whether or not it's a handshake or a photo op. The president campaigned on making Saudi Arabia a pariah. He talked about there was no redeeming qualities of the current government. It is led, obviously, by King Salman. But the day-to-day -day operations, everyone knows, is led by the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. The president then, when he came into office, released that intelligence report that said that Mohammed bin Salman approved the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, a Washington Post columnist. He has now had to deal with domestic policy concerns, which is higher gasoline prices. And you cannot fix the oil market without Saudi Arabia. Yes, Saudi Arabia alone cannot fix it, but they are the central bank of crude. You cannot go and try to bring down gasoline prices without engaging in the kingdom. And so now the president is going to go there, and this is going to be a huge about face on what he wanted to do with the kingdom. But in his op-ed piece, he talked about the fact that he wanted to reorient, not rupture. But he also so just days after he was inaugurated, said that he was only going to deal with the king. He will now be dealing with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and this is something that all eyes will be on. And potentially, after this meeting, yeah. he will get some more barrels on the market, and potentially that can help him in November. Okay, some barrels. But is the juice worth the squeeze at a time when spare capacity is not that great, <laughs> when you have not that much left that they can possibly pump, according to a whole host of analysts, and you have other OPEC nations that can't even keep up with their quotas as is. Well, the president is going to have to try to deal with this at home domestically. Right now, inflation, poll after poll, is the number one concern. So to use your phrase, juice for 
worth the squeeze, I think, to this administration at this moment. It is. But also to think that the administration was never going to have to deal with the kingdom over the course of four years is naive to a lot of people who look at this region. This is the biggest economy. They also want to expand upon the Abraham Accords. A huge country for Israel to do that with would be the kingdom. So at some point, the president was going to have to write this op-ed or make this trip. And Marie, folding in a deep knowledge of oil markets and OPEC. AMH, thank you with the latest. Ed Morse, here's the latest from City. This is what he's got to say. Tom, you'll like this. Oil is more likely to hit 50 than 150. Ed Morse going on oh. to say a slowdown in global growth could come alongside robust supply growth. If prices fall into the 60s or the 70s, he's suggesting OPEC Plus may well act again to support them. And what's important here, John, first of all, it's a victory lap for Dr. Morris. He's been lonely and very dead on in the pullback here from 124 to 100 on Brent crude. I'm going to call that a 20 percent uh, decline. John, what's so important here is the global political economics of Edward Morris is about nothing more than declining demand. I, I can't emphasize enough the bulls say bigger demand, bigger Pacific Rim demand. And Edward yep. Morris says, guess what? No demand, price down. That was not in the OPEC outlook for 2023, yeah. was it, Lisa? Not in a material way at all. No, they basically were projecting out that demand was going to outstrip supply materially for the upcoming years. And this really flies in the face of what we're seeing in the price action. I mean, how do you understand the decline that we've seen in crude prices facing off with one report after another from the main oil producing nations saying this isn't going to stop. This dynamic is here to stay. Gasoline prices are coming down. Will that provide some relief on CPI in July? For the month of June, we're looking for 8.8 percent headline year over year. A lot of people in this market will be very focused on the month over month core figure. As we often say, Tom, headline year over year, that's the front page of the Main Street newspaper for Wall Street, focused very much on the month over month yeah, figure go, and what I'll, that would mean yeah. for this Fed. It's very British. I mean, I'll go with that, that the month over the that's month here really, really. Yeah, it is. It really, really it matters here. Greenspan would we'll look at How chain so? year over year. But <laughs> really? the bottom line, John, is we're not talking about rents. We're not talking sure. about the elephant in the American inflation room, which is it. rent, rent equivalents, housing, whatever you want to call it. I get housing stalled. What is it? A 6% mortgage, 5.8%, whatever. But what I'm hearing coast to coast is rents are changing people's lives or behavior. I love how you do that. I think Lisa and I talked about rents four times in the last hour. 40% no, no. of course. No, just the, it's it. the okay. dominant story, and it's what to look at today. O-E-R. We are all talking about it. We are. O-E-R. Futures. E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> up by two tenths of one percent. You're going to get in trouble. The Nasdaq 100 up a third of one percent from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Sixty minutes away from CPI in America, going into it, futures positive by two tenths of one percent. On the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq, up by a third of 1%. You said it, TK. CPI Wednesday, going into JP Morgan Come Thursday. And you, Mitch, Friday. Lisa, very excited about that. Twos, tens and thirties. In the bond market, shaping up as follows. Yields coming in just a little bit. Down a basis point on a two-year. Down two basis points on a ten-year. Bit of curve inversion out there. That curve More inversion deepens yeah. over the last week. What do you make of that, John, time? this is the weak story. Is a, is a bond market... Is speaking volumes. I know it's dollar, dollar, dollar. I'm sorry, I got nine basis points on two cents spread. That's a change. Call it nine. Round it up to 50 sometime soon. That's what Priya Misra and TD might be looking for. Tom, going to catch up with Priya a little bit later. Another property. She yeah. thinks we've got work to do at the front end still. Short the two year. Looking for Fed funds to get out to 4%. I spoke to a couple wow. of people yesterday who mentioned inflation protection. They don't want you to give it up just yet. Pimco being one, Erin Brown, and then Jean Bavan over at BlackRock. Speaking a similar story, singing a similar tune, Tom, this idea that perhaps, in Mohammed's words, inflation could end up being somewhat stickier than we might expect, and that's got to be the number one thing we focus on right now going into this inflation report. Yo, I like what Dr. Olarian said yesterday. I believe it was in a tweet. I think I put it out as tweet of the day where, you know, forget about all the bow tie stuff, John. It's top line inflation. Just everybody get over it. This is the one time where what matters is how people are getting hammered by almost Spain double digit inflation. Ten minutes ago, it was all about rates, Tom. Rents well, you know, I've moved on. Or CPI. You know, You've moved on quickly. Tang, you know, I'm moving on.
Let's move on to foreign exchange briefly. We've had a rate hike from New Zealand's central bank, 50 basis points. The Bank of England might have to go 50 next month. GDP an upside surprise. That might give them the space to do that, should they wish. Euro dollar next week, next Thursday. And Tom, I know we're trying to get out to Frankfurt. Let's see if we can make that happen. Euro dollar 10054, positive two tenths of 1%. Lisa said it, I've said it, we've all said it. President Lagarde, somewhere between a rock and a hard place. Thank you, Tom. You were done. No, I, zero, just zero, zero, I five, thought, three. John, I thought we were going to don't Frankfurt, worry. Kentucky. We're, we're, don't worry. Don't worry. We're moving on, Tom. That's the cross okay. asset price action. We can get you some movers, some single names. Lisa will speak back to me. Hey, Lisa. <laughs> John, I was wondering, so I go on vacation, you guys head to Frankfurt. I love it. I'm, I'm really focused on Delta because those earnings were fascinating to me. What it highlights is the story of capacity not at levels that were back in 2019, still about 15 percentage, point, uh, percentage points uh, lower than where it was back then, but revenues back there. And basically, they're able to charge what they want. Still, people are seeing the earnings per share miss down nearly 3%. American Airlines and United both reporting next week, and both of those shares are also lower because of the earnings miss, because of the higher costs, not only from gasoline uh, and diesel, rather, uh, but also from having to pay their people more in order to attract talent, given that they want to meet the demand. And you're seeing American Air down 1.4%, United down 1%. The story also is very much about Google. And we've talked about this throughout the morning, John bringing up the fact that they're paring back some of their hiring plans for this year because of a need to be more hungry in the face of recession. You're seeing those shares up three tenths of a percent. Not a big move, but a big economic uh, potential message when they say that they do not see a need to be aggressive. How much do you see a similar follow on from the likes of Apple? We already have seen it from Microsoft as well as from Meta or Facebook. And Apple was downgraded by Citi because of some of these consumer headwinds, although still a buy, so I don't know how much uh, you're going to get a to potential revision there. Uh, you're seeing that those shares up by three tenths of a percent. I have to do this. Tom, Twitter, I think that this is interesting. Yesterday they fought back. Yeah, they basically no, I think said it's really to, something to Elon Musk. They said, no, you got to stick to this fifty four dollars and twenty cents a share uh, price tag that you said. We're going to hold you to it. How much is this a negotiating ploy? How much are they going to get dragged through the mud uh, right now? The shares are up. I mean, what do you make of this? It's I, trading like a penny stock. Well, even I, though it's what well, I would company. say to people tangential to this who think it's just back and forth on Twitter, they've gone beyond that. This is a really, really serious legal process in Delaware. I'm not sure Mr. Musk figured that out yet. Well, and the number of people have said it's a Pyrrhic battle. Everyone's going to lose. It's just a matter of how much. And Elon Musk yeah, could scrape know. by with just losing a billion dollars for the breakup fee. And that might be a best case scenario, some people are saying, for the uh, billionaire. How Less long are we going to talk away about this? CPR? How long are we going to talk about this, Twitter? Far more interested in the Apple story that Lisa touched on, Tom. I agree. Far more interested. Oh, no, totally agree. 146. Lisa mentioned that city call. Their price target still 175 down from 200. So that's some some serious upside TK <clears throat> they're looking for. We heard from a guest earlier. When does growthiness matter? You know I mean, I mean, that's going to be maybe the, the the move here through the summer is the, the shift back some kind of bull sense, at least in uh, the growth names. Who knows? Futures up eight. Dow futures up 55 right now. Uh, joining us, Pooja Shriram uh, with us, U.S. economist at Barclays as well. I love in your note, we were talking about this, Pooja, earlier, which is you say shelter inflation will run firm. What I see is in Cleveland, Ohio, single family home rents are up 13 percent. I mean, I mean, that's the reality in a place like Cleveland where it's reasonable. It is double digit rent inflation. What does that mean for the report this morning? Uh, thanks, Tom, for having me uh, on the show. Um, we think uh, shelter inflation is likely to run strong, exactly as you pointed out. Um, the BLS data, though, is not showing a double-digit increase as yet. Um, as we you know, wrote in our note, um, some of that is, is due to the lag with private market indicators. Uh, but we think that uh, you know, today we're going to get another firm rent and OER print. We're forecasting a 0.6% increase month over month. And uh, sheltered inflation overall close to 5.5%. You know, so, so the eight percent number. Let us get. To, and I usually don't do this, Apuja, but I think there's enough of a focus here on CPI Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Nuance eight point nine or eight point seven percent inflation. What's the so what of that? I'm sorry. Say that again, Tom. I'm if we're at eight point eight percent, and we get eight point nine or we mm -hmm. get eight point seven, what's the so what 
of a little bit of a movement there? Uh, well, I think um, you know some of that move could be influenced by how the core categories perform. We've got a pretty fair picture of what happened to energy prices um, in uh, June. And, you know, we're looking for an increase of about 7% on the month. I think the real um, uncertainty today would be around what happens to some of these core categories. Our own forecast is, you know, that there's likely to be some easing in core CPI. We're forecasting a 0.5% increase on the month uh, compared to the 0.6% that we saw uh, in May. Uh, it's not a whole lot of relief, but it's definitely a move in the right direction. Uh, but let's say, you know, core CPI continues to run strong. It could easily be an 8.9% print. Pooja, what can we accurately call this uh, an issue of stagflation? Mm -hmm. It is because, you know, it's uh, forecasting inflation has is become extremely uncertain and difficult in this environment because a lot of it has to do with, you know, some of these external forces that are influencing prices. So, we you know, as economists, uh, we do the best with the data we have in hand. Uh, and then, you know, uh, we hope for a little bit of luck. Well, Pooja, is there any way to get out of stagflation without a Volcker-esque response? And I think that this really is the question for so many people hoping for those external factors that are not coming and seeing that some of the drivers of the inflation in the U.S. are stickier. At what point can you say that this is not different than what we saw in terms of 40 years ago and how the Fed has to respond? Yeah, it's, it's going to be a tough call for the Fed, to be honest. Um, I think, you know, like you pointed out, since a lot of these factors are supply driven, um, you know, monetary policy is limited in scope uh, with what it can do. Um, you know, the Fed hiking rates can only have so much of an effect on, on bringing price pressures down. And unfortunately, it's a crude channel of, uh, you know, lowering demand. Um, and to the extent that that works, we might get some relief. Uh, but really, any easier way out of it will completely depend on these factors coming down. So it's the July parlor game, which is what's more important, uh, CPI Wednesday, J.P. Morgan Thursday, or University of Michigan Friday? I think all of it, to be honest. Um, oh, I think, bad. you know, the, the Fed is, is really in a, in a sticky spot right now. Um, you know, some of the, the Fed speak that we've heard over the past few days suggest that they are focused on price stability. Um, some of the members have downplayed signals of, of demand easing. We got a June um, jobs report, which was pretty solid. So right now, at all points in the direction of, you know, maybe they're leaning towards a 75 basis point hike. But then we still have a lot of important data uh, coming out this week, like you pointed out, a retail sales print and inflation expectations. So it's going to be a tough decision for them. Thank you, Pooja. Pooja Sridram there of Barclays Investment Bank. You, Mitch, does my head in. I know it does. It really That's why does. I keep mentioning it. I used it. to follow you, Mitch. <laughs> I used to follow you, Mitch. You did too. We'd look at the sentiment numbers. You might pay some attention to the inflation expectations component of the survey, but not too much. And I'm not sure too many people would trade on it either. Then all of a sudden, Chairman Pound Bank becomes this thing that's the difference between 50 basis points and 75, and that just seems to be absolutely ridiculous. And I know Mike McKee pretty frustrated about it too. I spoke to him yesterday. Well, I, I think that it's not just the University of Michigan headline numbers, but the expectations for inflation over the next five to 10 years. And we actually didn't talk about this. It was sort of a below the radar story, but the New York Fed expectations of consumers for inflation over the next five to 10 years actually came down a little bit earlier this week. How much is that a, an indicator, a tea leaf, that this could actually be a little bit of an easing factor heading into uh, what we expect from the Fed in a couple of weeks' time? Everything else came down with it. That's the problem, Tom, in the New York Fed Consumer Expectations uh. Survey. Home price expectations were lower, spending expectations were lower, credit access perceptions were lower, weaker, household financial situation, perceptions of that deteriorated, not great across the board. John, I'm just going to suggest to, to aggregate all this is wrong. It's the biggest argument I ever had with Alan Meltzer, the late great of Carnegie Mellon, where he said you've got to aggregate statistics. We just showed Cleveland uh, there with, you know, a pretty good up double digit kind of housing. Phoenix is the hottest market in the country. Home prices at one point this year were up 32 oh. percent year over year. And my point here, John, is how do you fold that into a national number? I get that. But I just don't think we can go homogenous one statistic oh, Tom, here totally, aggregated. Totally, and you've I been on top of this. Buy it. And that's true of the consumer, too. What does the aggregate numbers tell you about the consumer? We'll get a series of guests telling us that the consumer is strong. The disparity beneath, that's a different story sometimes. Futures up a third of 1% on the S&P. CPI data, 50 minutes away from New York City. This is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The International Energy Agency warns that oil prices pose a high risk to the global economy. It says there are signs that fuel costs are starting to hurt demand growth. The IEA trim forecasts for oil consumption this year and next. Still, it says the demand weakness is being offset by tightening supply. A chaotic day in Sri Lanka where a state of emergency was declared after President Gotabaya Rajapaksa fled the country. Protesters gathered outside the presidential palace and later seized the state-run broadcaster, forcing it to go off the air. Sri Lanka is a bankrupt, partly due to Rajapaksa's policies. Inflation is running at 70% and there's a shortage of food, fuel and medicine. COVID vaccines from AstraZeneca and Pfizer saved roughly 12 million lives the first year of their rollout. That is according to a new analysis from Airfinity, a London data firm that says the two companies swiftly scaled up production and delivered doses before other manufacturers. Once again, Spirit Airlines has delayed a shareholder vote on its proposed merger with Frontier. Earlier this week, Frontier said it was still very far from winning enough support because of a higher offer from JetBlue. The new shareholder vote is set for July 27th. And those second quarter earnings at Delta Airlines missed expectations. The airline said that high operating costs will persist through the rest of the year. U.S. carriers are trying to return to consistent earnings after the pandemic hammered travel. Delta says it expects what it calls meaningful full-year profits. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. have now only just realized euro can keep heading lower when we get to 95 we're kind of basing that on the Nord Stream 1 flows maybe coming back to 40% of their capacity. What 90 cents is, that's the scenario where Nord Stream 1 does not come back on. This is what I love about FX analysis right it's now, crazy. and that was Jordan Rochester <laughs> of Nomura. They're not talking about the ECB next week, Tom. They're talking about Nord Stream 1 coming back online and how much gas yeah. comes through it. That's what you're basing your Euro-dollar well, call on right now. In, in, in defense of these guys, when it's quiet, it's quiet. And when you get big figure moves, which is what they're getting, one full figure, whatever the pair is, they all get lathered up. I mean, I like what sure. Shit and Sakchen said about it yesterday. You know, parody, okay, great. Can we move on? You know, it's just a number. Yeah, but to George, let's be clear here. Mr. Rochester has been dead on. I saw, I think it was Zero Edge quoting him yesterday, quoting Nomura yesterday. He's been fantastic, and I'm not yeah. criticizing them. That's just what the FX call on the euro yeah. comes down to now it's gas supply i'll run through things quickly futures up a third of one percent on the s p on the nasdaq of four tenths of one percent 41 minutes away from cpi in america yields in a basis point 295.76 crude bouncing back from ugly losses yesterday at one percent 96.80 this from city moments ago <clears> tom <throat> they're looking for 0.6 percent month on month core headline oh, year man. over year 8.9 so 8.9 really return investor attention wow. to upside risk to inflation rather than downside risk to growth from the American Andrew Hollenhorst. Well, this, over some, at City. this is important. We so need British. to summarize this. For those that don't sure. keep score, Hollenhorst has been way out front on this. He has been in market economics leading the way on a higher terminal rate and nudging, as I said before, to Puja. 8.8 out to 8.9 is not a small tenth of a percentage He's point. He's not matter. alone on 8.9, Tom. There's a couple <clears> of banks that are looking yep. for the same. Deutsche Bank. City at 8.9, HSBC at 8.9, TD at 8.9, Goldman at 8.9. You wow. said Deutsche Bank at 9, Lisa? Yep. I missed that. There you go. Throw Deutsche Bank into the mix, Tom. CPI Wednesday. You're excited, Let's aren't you? save ourselves with Kriti Gupta and Chart of the Day. Kriti, what do you have? Well, it comes down to that exact theme, except in the FX space. Let's take it outside of the United States and talk about the ultimate carry trade that, at the end of the day, is based on that inflation data. I'm talking, of course, about the worst performing currency, the Japanese yen, and the best performing currency, the Brazilian real. That is, of course, if you exclude the Russian ruble and the capital controls there. My Chart of the Day, Tom, shows you that ultimate carry trade going back 20 years and the cyclicality of it. For our radio audience, imagine kind of just this ebb 
and flow, essentially these waves almost that you are seeing over 20 years. The reason I bring up this particular chart is not just because of that carry differential, which of course has been a trade that's been at play in this market in the last, I want to say, two years or so, but also because this specific currency pair, it's now approaching levels we last saw in 2017, which marked a major pivot point that you saw in this major economy. What's interesting here is this time we're hitting that pivot point and the calls aren't for growth the way that they were back in 2017. Yen real? Yen real. Yen real. Okay, I've never looked at it. Jeremy Stretch has. We'll move over to Jeremy Stretch right now, head of G10FX Strategy at CIBC. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Tom. Today. How do you bring this inflation report over to your study of foreign exchange? Well, you're absolutely right. The inflation print is going to be the defining factor as far as today is concerned. And it really comes back to how much of an, a sort of an aggressive reaction function you're going to price in from the Fed. And of course, uh, our base case scenario is that until we see a definitive and durable um, peak in inflation, then markets are going to remain biased towards the left hand end of that dollar smile. So that keeps the dollar relatively well supported against the bulk of the major currencies. That includes the euro. And of course, that takes us back to that whole debate about parity and whether it's relevant or not. Uh, but also, I think we, we will continue to see the, uh, you know, the, you, the dollar remaining well bid against not only the growth oriented currencies, uh, but also some of those that are related to commodity revenue. So I think it's an overall uh, bias that if we are going to see an upside surprise in inflation, I was just listening to your discussions regarding uh, which houses are looking for an upside surprise. If that is the reaction function, then I think we will continue to see the dollar uh, remaining uh, generalized uh, well bid. But Jeremy, we started this segment talking about how a lot of FX, FX strategists have to pay more attention to the dynamic in gas pipelines than they do uh, to the rate policies of different central banks. How important is central bank policy at this point, given some of the other concerns? Well, central bank policy is always important, but I think certainly when you're talking about gas supplies, and in effect, we're talking effectively about what's happening in the Eurozone, and uh, just listening to those comments about Nord Stream 1, I think those are very relevant. Uh, so in a sense, I think from an ECB perspective, we're assuming that uh, the ECB has effectively pre-committed itself to its policy narrative as regards next, me next week's meeting. So I think it would be an extreme surprise if the ECB were to do anything other than the hiking by 25 basis points. So in a sense, that leads us back to looking at the other key differentials or key reaction functions in terms of the Eurozone. And clearly, gas supply is an evidential uh, concern because, of course, not only are we worried about supply, but also we're looking at prices because, of course, we've seen a substantial uptick in terms of gas prices. So even if supplies come back, we're still going to see um, competitiveness of the uh, Eurozone manufacturing sector being compromised. And that still uh, labors into that uh, negative euro narrative, which seems likely to persist over the course of the summer period. Jeremy, what do rate hikes from the ECP actually achieve? Well, I think uh, from, a, from a central bank perspective, you have to remember that what central banks are aiming to achieve, and particularly those that are predetermined in terms of uh, targeting inflation, it's all about managing or attempting to manage inflation expectations. So in a sense, the ECB has been very late to the party in terms of both ending bond purchases uh, and also looking at to adjust the policy in terms of graduated tightening. But what the ECB are attempting to achieve is to uh, signal to the market that they haven't given up on inflation. Inflation expectations still matter. And I think the one point that I would sort of uh, point uh, out in terms of the ECB's favor as we go into next week's meeting, if you look at those inflation expectations, if you're looking at the Eurozone five-year, five-year inflation swap, that has come back from the sort of extremes that we were seeing a month or two ago when we were well in excess of that 2% target threshold. So we have seen inflation expectations remaining relatively anchored, and that's partly due to the market anticipating the ECB will be turning the rate cycle starting next week with that 25 basis point move. Jeremy Stretch, what a mess for this European Central Bank again. Jeremy Stretch there of CIBC. TK, does the ECB ever have an easy time? No. No, th that's a really important observation, John, and that goes back to Jean Monnet. It's never, ever, ever been easy. There's been some nuances along the way, the difference between Doisenberg and Trichet, et cetera. I would say with Mr. Draghi, there was almost a sense, not of normal, that's not the right word. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't call it normal. More of a con there was more of an interior economic confidence, I would suggest, with a gentleman from Italy than with anybody else, without any disparagement to the others. But also, John, it's still a very young organization. I, I think I agree. it's yeah. important. Eight years it's institution of Mario Draghi and not a single rate hike, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. We were asking that of President Lagarde when she took over. 
we were sitting here thinking, I asked the question a million times, would we actually ever get a rate hike from President Lagarde? Some people thought we might go through a whole cycle again without that happening, and that changed pretty quickly. Right, and so before we give Draghi, Mario Draghi, a victory lap for his reign over the ECB, it's important to look at the dynamic that we're looking at right now, where it was low rates forever for a decade, and suddenly it's no more, and all of a sudden we're talking about runaway inflation and uh, the potential reversion back to the 1970s. I mean, this is a completely different scenario, an ECB that has no precedent to follow on this front with a disjointed uh, backdrop in terms of the nations and the different kinds of economies. Worth remembering that rates of the ECB are still negative 50 basis points. <laughs> Just putting that out there. Futures right now, positive a third of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, up four tenths of 1%. With Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. In the next hour, 34 minutes away, inflation data in America. From New York, this is Bloomberg. There's a pretty consistent message coming from the Fed's bosses that they need to think about wrapping this tightening cycle up. People are worried. Can we continue to grow earnings at the pace at which people are hoping for? The system only starts really cracking seriously if there's a massive fear. The fear of an expectations-driven spiral is just not justified anymore. It was a risk, but it's not there. The U.S. equity market is part of that story. It's already signaling that things are going to get worse. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen. It's CPI Day. That's what Ira Jersey says, our head of fixed income. We're all pumped up like Ira Jersey is for a happy CPI Day. But seriously, John, Jersey is focused on what matters in 30 minutes, which what does it do to curve inversion and that predictor of growth slowdown? The data's been miserable, and let's be clear about this. It would take a monster downside surprise to get this Fed to go with 50 and not 75. Oh, come on, It would 75. take a long string of them a long string of CPI softness, so to speak, to get this Fed to think about pausing. Tom, one month's not going to change the story, but this one month could be the big one. Three meetings out to the September Fed meeting as well. Three reports, I should say, out to the Fed, uh, the September uh, meeting. John, what matters to me is shelter. What I hear anecdotally from every conversation is on rent, and home ownership, to me, that's the focus of the report. So we've asked the question a few times, have we seen that mechanical peak in year-over-year -year inflation? Then we get another big, strong print. Yeah, Gas yeah. prices will be a feature this morning, no doubt about it. Will that fade in the next month? For this month, Tom, and to your point, <clears throat> when you look at core CPI and you strip out the energy story, how yeah. sticky is that going to be? I keep going back to that question Mohamed Dalarian asked, because I think it's really, really important. If rents stay, Tom, elevated and right. inflation remains sticky and sure we get away from nine eight seven six where do we settle down at and what does it mean for this fed we already settled down and what i liked was the analysis yesterday of ian shepherdson john of core core uh, inflation. The gentleman over at Pantheon saying you've got to slice and di dice this with some nuance. We'll do that at 8.30. This is what Ian had to say in his report coming out <laughs> yesterday ahead of today. We reckon gasoline prices contributed 0.4 percentage points to the month-to-month -month increase in June, but they look set to subtract 0.3 percentage points from July. So in Ian's mind, you might be able to get away from that big year-over-year year hump, Tom, and start coming down right. the other side. But ultimately, Ian's on top of the story. You're on top of Lisa Rears. I am others, too. The rent story into year-end. Lisa, the president landing in Israel, the beginning of an historic trip, our Emory Horton there. And I'm most certain all President Biden cares about is a top-line statistic. Well, and that seems to be what a lot of people, even Mohammed Alarian, are focused on at a time when the core might take on less meaning. And I still point to that Citigroup report that John mentioned in the previous hour that a strong CPI reading for June could return investor attention to upside risk to inflation, talking about how the inputs of services and shelter, right. as we talk about rent, are going to continue to accelerate even as core continues to cool. We're going to dive in with this with some good guests. Lee Farage to be with us in a moment. John, we got to waltz through the data, even though, to me, it's almost stasis data this morning. And I guess I start with some of the gloom out there, Delta, whatever, you know, they're off a little bit and such. Futures up 17 gets my attention. And this can all change in 27 minutes when we get that inflation number. Agreed. Futures right now up a half of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, up six tenths of 1%. Then it's into earnings tomorrow. The equity market picture could be different again 
when we hear from the banks, JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley. Yields in a single basis point, 296.13 on a 10-year crude. Hammered yesterday, up just four-tenths of 1% on crude today at 96.21. And Tom, just briefly, if you bring up the commodity screen on the Bloomberg, you'll take a quick look at copper. Down again, another half of 1% on copper on the Alamee. Interesting to see. And I'd also mention the Financial Conditions Index, which is a soup of ratios, is actually doing better than good here, moving from one standard deviation negative to a more constructive number. Here again, 26 minutes away from this report. Lee Ferrets joins us. Wonderful to have him here in the top slot of the 8 a.m. hour for us worldwide. Welcome on radio and TV because of decades of experience. Lee, why is this inflation focus different than the other ones you and I lived decades ago? This is so much higher, Tom, and I think, you know, we're getting this situation where we clearly the economy is slowing, um, but inflation remains stubbornly high. And then we have the situation in Ukraine, which means food and energy prices are still elevated. And it just makes for a horrible backdrop, even even something you and I have never lived through before, quite honestly. So, Lee, when do you start thinking about buying stocks in that world? Not yet, Jonathan, not yet. Um, look, you know, we're going to get another high number today. Um, you know, headlines going to going to hit a new 40 year high. I'm watching core very closely. We are starting to see the weakness in the consumer sector come through in some areas of core. But the Fed's got to keep the path, right? They're going to have to keep being extremely hawkish until they're not. And they're going to pivot very quickly when they pivot, but it's not yet. So, so you're going to have this backdrop of a hawkish central bank, poor data. And the fact is, that's just not a good background for stocks. Can you push that through the bond market as well? Push it through the Treasury yield curve. What does that mean? Well, you've got the added complication of QT, right? We're doing quantitative tightening now. Um, you know, it's it, 47 and a half at the moment. We're going up to 95 on the 1st of September. You have to factor that into what it means to the Treasury curve. So, listen, longer end yields should be a lot lower given what we're seeing in equities, but they're not. They're staying up here um, relatively high, not given the inflation rate, but relatively high given the, the economic mm. data because of that QT, and that's going to carry on being a drag. So you're going to see... Long end's got these conflicting factors. We're going to stick around this 3% level, I think, in the 10-year at the same time as equities sell off. So you don't get a relief there for equities from long end yields coming down aggressively. So what's the ballast in your trade to prepare for more pain ahead? Uh, it's a really good question. It's, I still like the dollar when it comes to FX. And, and I know it's overvalued. I know it's overowned, and we've moved a long way. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if stocks are going down, we have this uncertain backdrop that we have. It's still the ultimate safe haven in terms of FX. The dollar carries on rallying. And that's what I'm expecting to see. So, you know, parity is a big focus against the euro. It's a number, right? We can go through that. We can get to 97. We can get possibly lower than that. So, you know, for me, I, I still like the dollar. And then in terms of, you know, asset markets, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I still relatively like the long end. And I like cash right now. It's just that sort of environment, I'm afraid. If you still see more dollar strength ahead, what does that mean for your euro region that's reeling in the face of uncertainty around gas, of a euro that has gotten massively depreciated with inflation where it is and people saying this could be the epicenter of the next downward shift? Yeah, it, 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 yes, it's hard to argue with that, quite honestly. I mean, Europe is the epicenter right now. Um, you know, we, we already have massively high inflation, 8.6% there, negative rates. The ECB are just starting their hiking cycle, but already the data on the economy is extremely worrying. So, yeah, and, and, and the fact is the euro weakness is only going to exacerbate those inflation risks. So it's actually a lot worse for the eurozone and the UK as well. Anywhere this strong dollar actually increases inflation elsewhere because at the very least commodities are priced in dollars and so those prices will go up even more than they will in the US. So we focus on the Fed. We're worried about the situation here and what the Fed are going to do. It's worse in other places. That's why you still like the dollar. Lee, how synchronized will this global downturn be? Last year we were always talking about this synchronized global reopening, synchronized global growth story and then China didn't really feature in it in the way people thought it would. It's not featuring right now. Stop, start, reopen, lock down, reopen, maybe lock down again. Lee, walk me through how synchronized you think this downturn could be and tell me where on earth does China fit in? I mean, it's going to be extremely synchronized. We've, we've seen that over cycles for the last 20 years or so. We've, globalization is, is fantastic on the upside. 
it has the same downside effect. Every world slows, slows together. Every developed market is facing the same problems in terms of high inflation, slowing growth, declining real wages. China, at some point, will be a support for the global economy. But as you say, it's lockdown open, lockdown open. You know, we're, we're talking about a new wave of COVID in, in, in the US and in Europe coming through now. So, you know, that's still going to be with us. It's going to be with us for a while. China's policy is to react much, much, much more draconiously than other places. So it's hard to rely on China really being a growth engine for, a, a, a growth engine for the world yep. this year. I think you can't rely on that. Lee, awesome to get your thoughts. Lee Farage there of State Street Global Markets. And for those of you just tuning in, we had some trade data out of China overnight. Record trade surplus. Exports absolutely surging. Take a look at what happened to imports. They weakened 1%, mm -hmm. Tom. They weakened to 1%. That's a problem. That's a problem for the global growth backdrop. The dynamics are there as well, and part of that is the international relations. John, the president landing at Ben Gurion Airport in Israel now to begin that sojourn. And I understand this is about hydrocarbons, is about building relationships, but John, it folds in to world trade. He's going to deliver remarks, I imagine, Tom, at the arrival ceremony. I'm told actually, in about 20 minutes time. So around the time we get the CPI report, yeah. we'll work through the inflation report, Tom, then I imagine we'll work through the headlines from the president if there are any shortly after. Landing in Tel Aviv here, I'm going to call it 40 miles from Jerusalem to the south uh, east as well. John, this is exciting. You know, I mean, we've been making jokes about it all morning, but you know what? It, it's an historic moment in the measurement of price change in America. This is a big moment for diplomacy in the Middle East as well. And for price change, if you want to fold that into what's happening on the screens right now, look to Friday and look to a different country, Saudi Arabia. Lisa, there's going to be a meeting between the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and the President of the United States. We understand, according to Jake Sullivan, the President's National Security Advisor, that will take place on Friday evening. And President Biden is trying to spin this as really a foreign diplomacy issue and trying to forge better relationship with the Middle East and with Saudi Arabia. The focus very much, at least among the media and other pundits, is very much about gas prices. Can they get more uh, pumping from Saudi Arabia? Again, this gets to spare capacity, though. How much do they have to pump. The arrival ceremony begins for the President of the United States, touching down in Tel Aviv, Israel, for his trip to the Middle East. Our coverage will continue with futures up four tenths of one percent on the S&P. Inflation data in America, 18 minutes away. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Numbers are out a few minutes from now. We'll show that inflation in the U.S. likely hit another four-decade high last month, according to the median forecast in a Bloomberg survey. The Consumer Price Index probably rose 8.8% from a year ago. That would be the largest jump since 1981, and it would keep the Federal Reserve on track for another big interest rate hike this month. President Biden's problems at home are looming over a Middle East trip that's all about oil. The president arrives today in Israel, the first stop on his journey. It's the, the visit to Saudi Arabia though, that's seen as crucial. The hope is that restoring relations with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman will secure a boost in oil production and help ease some of those gasoline prices. He's meeting with the Crown Prince Friday night. And in the UK, Rishi Sunak heads a final list of eight candidates seeking to become the next Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister. Sunak's resignation last week helped trigger Boris Johnson's downfall. Today will be the first round of balloting amongst Tory MPs. The candidate with the least support is knocked out, along with anyone receiving fewer than 30 votes. And the crisis in Sri Lanka is widening. Protesters took to the streets of Colombo after President Gotabaya Rajapaska fled the country for the Maldives. Demonstrators seized the state-run TV channel and forced it off the air. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's prime minister declared a state of emergency. Sri Lanka's economy has been hurt by soaring inflation and shortages of food, fuel and medicine. Second quarter earnings at Delta Airlines missed expectations. The airline said that high operating costs will persist through the rest of the year. U.S. carriers are trying to return to consistent earnings after the pandemic hammered travel. Delta says it expects what it calls meaningful full-year profits. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The Great Moderation is over. To our mind, that means that this last 40 years where we were able to see both 
growth and inflation volatility basically being very subdued um, as a change. Uh, it's already the case for the last two years. And we think this is persistent. Fascinating to catch up with Jean Pavan yesterday, the head of the BlackRock Investment Institute from New York City. We are 12 minutes away from inflation data in America going into it. Here's the price action up a third of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100 up four tenths of 1% into the FX market, euro dollar 10067, positive a third of 1%. The euro having a rare day, showing some strength in the bond market. Yields down two basis points to 295, crude up just a quarter of 1% from yesterday's slam down, $96 and around about 10 cents. A lot to talk about, Tom. Inflation data in just a moment. And moments ago, the president landing in Tel Aviv, Israel. Yeah, we're going to do what we do on Bloomberg surveillance, juggle three or four things here, including with an esteemed guest. They await the president at Ben Gurion Airport at Tel Aviv. Again, the move to Jerusalem uh, scheduled here in a bit. The beginning of the trip, the Robin's Egg Blue Air Force One that we all know has been busy over the last number of days. John, I, I can't remember a president who's traveled this much. Bavaria, Madrid, home, rest. Back, back to the Middle the East. Yeah. Really something. Let's continue, though, here 12 minutes away from this important inflation report. We're going to show you this while we talk about the importance of this economy. We have a wonderful gentleman to do this, R.J. Gallo. Senior fixed income portfolio manager. Uh, yes, with municipal bonds that we don't talk about enough at Federated RMS. Uh, RJ, I want to talk about a phrase you use, which is yield to worst. And the answer is if we have sustained inflation, or even if inflation comes down, what does it do to the yield to worst of our listeners and our viewers? Don't they just lose with inflation? Well, re real returns are decidedly negative right now, given the much too high rates of inflation, you know, north of 8%. Most people don't remember numbers like that. Um, the bond market desperately needs the expectations that inflation will decelerate and do so soon to be realized in the data that we're about to see and in subsequent CPI and PCE releases in coming months. If we don't get that, then not only do you have negative real yields, but we're gonna resume the price drops that have been pretty extreme that dominated the first six months of 2022 in terms of negative bond returns. And that's been especially real recently, at least, in the, in the front end of the yield curve. How much do you actually take comfort in the conviction trade that's been developing over the longer end, over going into duration, 10-year, 30-year treasuries, in order to get that protection longer term? Uh, and how much do you actually think that people perhaps are underestimating this inflationary push? Uh, it's a great question. I think for much of the year, the inflationary surge has dominated price action in all markets as the Federal Reserve had to pivot away from transitory to becoming a, an inflation hawk with all talons out. Um, as a result, you've had deeply negative total returns and fixed income. Stocks have struggled. We know, we know the story. I think there's a lot of confidence in the markets now that the Fed is attacking the inflation problem that we will get the inflation deceleration and it will be pretty sharp as months and quarters evolve from here. The, the real risk is that that's just too optimistic. Um, fortunately, I think the U.S. economy is much more flexible these days than it was the last time 40 years ago when we had inflation at this rate. Back then, it took a deep recession and many, many months, years to, to really work out the inflation. Um, hopefully, the hopes that the flexible economy will disinflate the rate of change of prices faster this time can occur. I think bond investors are getting a little bit more constructive right now. We've reduced our short duration position to just a modest lean short. So we're in that camp, but that's more in a wait and see mode. We have not gone long. We're not calling for uh, uh, yields to fall at this point. We still think there's a little bit of an upward drift and inflation remains the key while recession risks have risen. What's the bigger risk based on positioning right now for the Federal Reserve, a hotter than expected CPI print or one that comes in softer? Um, I think the Fed would be very happy to see softer inflation readings. Uh, they let the inflation genie surge out of the bottle much too rapidly with their shift to a backward looking paradigm uh, right after the pandemic hit where they basically stopped being forward looking. It was forward looking monetary policy that Volcker and Greenspan and all the precedents to Powell had practiced that allowed inflation to be very, very low. If you become a reactive central bank, in the face of massive inflationary problems, the likes of which we have not seen in decades, 
uh, you get where we are today. They need inflation to come down. They'd be much happier to see a softer print. A firm print merely gets them more in the box where greater policy actions needed to fight inflation, but that just helps to foment the already strong inflation fears. RJ, the president just about to get off the plane get off Air Force One and the focus for many people in this market is not today, it's Friday when he's set to meet the, meet the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and there's a real energy crunch taking place right now around the world but more acutely in Europe. RJ, when you think about fixed income, how are you thinking about Europe and what happens here with the energy situation and ultimately what happens with Bunds? Well, the correlation between bun yields and Treasury yields is strong. Uh, you know, you go back 30, 40 years ago, um, one wouldn't think that that bunds could necessarily lead treasuries. Uh, they certainly can now. Uh, when you think about the scale of the European Union as an economic entity, and you think about the integration of global financial markets, uh, the, the, the stark challenges that the European economy faces, uh, partly due to the war, but certainly due to the, the broader energy problems that, that the continent faces, um, they're, they're very supportive of bond returns. Uh, over the last month, the, the Bloomberg Aggregate Index is positive. Um, and as the economy has slowed in Europe, it has contributed to that dynamic as yields have retraced off of their recent highs. Uh, that's quite a change in, in the narrative from where we were, uh, you know, back in, into May when inflation, inflation, inflation was all the concern. The European situation, the energy shock that's going on there is part and parcel why we are getting more concerned about recession here and recession, you know, really globally. RJ Gallo of Federated Hermes. RJ, thank you, sir. As always, brilliant to catch up. Tom, we're waiting to hear from the president. We get this arrival ceremony. We get some remarks from him as well in just a moment. But to RJ's point, the focus right now, much more so on what is happening with energy, what will take place in that meeting on Friday, and what on earth happens to the European economy through this year. Well, yeah, I, I would say the European economy with the war in Ukraine is certainly one of the themes for the president uh, meeting with any number of leaders of the Middle East here is the war in Ukraine. But also, John, I would mention what we haven't talked about this week enough, which is China. One of the setbacks into this inflation report and the worry about growth is what we're not talking about in Asia, which is it's been a tough week for the coronavirus as we well. We keep ramping up that conversation, Lisa, the prospect of more lockdowns, more restrictions. How much is that the real reason behind what we've seen in oil mm -hmm. and gas prices? And that really is what people right. are saying, at least this week. So then what happens if they pare back the zero COVID policy, right? I mean, they're basically trying to come out with all the parameters and the soup of uncertainty that we keep hearing from all of the analysts on the show. Tom, final word. I think it's going to be interesting to see this trip, frankly, is way more important than what we saw in Bavaria and in Madrid, even with the history that we saw in Madrid with NATO. Uh, this is perhaps the key trip for this president in this first term. This program shifts its attention to CPI. Inflation data in America coming up next. Equity futures going into it, elevated by a half of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. We are seconds away from inflation data in the United States of America. Going into it, futures positive, a full one percentage point on the S&P, on the NASDAQ, up by 1.3%. That's a big move higher. Wow. Here's your economic data, and that is an upside surprise. Here's Mike McKee. Yes, John, we have an upside surprise, certainly with the headline up 1.3% on the month. That's going to reflect energy prices rebounding even more from May. And that puts the year-over-year -year headline number at 9.1%. That's going to be a scary number for a lot of Americans. The core comes in up 7 tenths, a disappointment. It had come up uh, 6 tenths the uh, month before, and the expectation was it would drop back to just half a percent. It doesn't suggest that uh, inflation's momentum has been slowed. We do see a bit of a drop, probably on base effects, 5.9% for the CPI year over year, the core over year over year. That is down a tenth from 6% a year ago or a month ago. Now, taking a look at the overall numbers, uh, trying to get a, a handle on where the inflation is coming from. It is, of course, gasoline prices. And I'm just checking here for gasoline was up 11.2% during the month of June. Over the year, 59.9%. I'm putting numbers on something people just uh, 
drop their jaws at <laughs> every time they fill up their tank. Food at home has been important. That is kind of plateaued, 1% gain on a year-over-year -year basis of 12.2%. So a little bit of help on the food front uh, in terms of other things that have uh, changed. Apparel, we had thought there might be a drop because of bloated inventories, but it rises eight-tenths of a percent, up 5.2% on the year. And used cars. Uh, the wholesale numbers from Mannheim had gone down, but used car prices rise 1.6%. They're up 7.1% on the year. New cars uh, rise by eight tenths. Uh, they, uh, I'm sorry, by seven tenths, and they're up 11.4 percent of the year. So a lot of the contributors to the inflation rate that the Fed had worried about and thought might be transitory uh, apparently are not. Except uh, we've now, it seems, passed the peak for airline fares. They fell 1.8 percent. That doesn't count looking for Tom's lost luggage. Mike, keep looking. Not for the luggage. For more data, I'm going to go through the price action. We crater lower on the S&P 500. Big pop going into the number. Not sure what that was about. Then we dropped lower by more than one percentage point on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 1.6 percent on the Nasdaq 100. Yield higher by six basis points on a 10-year, but it's the front end that gets your attention. Up another eight basis points to 3.13 percent. The curve inversion now negative 11 basis points. In the FX market, we still can't take out parity. Euro dollar lower the session 10006. But TK front and center, big upside surprise. 9.1. Wow. Lisa and I went through all the estimates. Nobody was looking for 9.1. There it is. And it's, 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 it's all about the partition of inflation. I think a David Rosenberg has got 40 or 50 items that he looks at. And we'll dive into that over the next coming days to look at where we are in America. But, John, it just makes that further away the September Fed meeting or the one after it. John, let me bring this up because I know the gloom crew will bring it up. If we're going to 75 beeps, what are we waiting for? Should they be lifting rates a stick? Well, we expected 75, and I'm not sure if 9.1 makes a difference, but 8.1, but it will be core CPI that gets people's attention, Tom. Yes, yes, Month on yes, month at 0 0.7. I don't know how many people were looking for a pickup from the previous month, but we got one. Mike, you came out with a ton of numbers. Can you focus on two for us? Tell me the contribution from gas again, one. And two, can you walk me through the rental story and how sticky that number looks to you? John, we'll start with uh, rents. O OER rents, the, the way they compute home prices, uh, owners' uh, uh, equivalent rents, up seven-tenths. That's uh, the highest we've seen in some months. Um, and it does show that even though we are seeing home prices fall, that uh, takes a while to get into the numbers. Home sales fall. That takes a while to get into the numbers. And that's really going to push up core and keep it elevated for a long while. And then gasoline prices, of course, up 4.8% right, right. on the month. No shock there. The headline, guys, 9.1% uh, yeah. is the highest since November of 1981. Okay, Mike, I want you to help us here as the president is in Tel Aviv now being greeted by the prime minister and the president of Israel. Guess what? He's in, he's thinking there during the ceremonies of 9.1% inflation. He's going to turn to Jerome Powell and say, do something. What is the number one tool Chairman Powell has right now at 9.1%? Well, you know, in a way, I would say forward guidance because the Fed can do 75 and has basically said they were going to in July. If he wants to up that, and I'm not sure he does, I think they feel 75 is a fairly strong enough move. He could let that out now and the markets would immediately reprice that. So the Fed still has some juice in the markets with job owning, uh, but I'm not sure there's going to be a whole lot of change. There isn't much you can do if you're the Fed about gasoline prices. Unfortunately, you're kind of stuck. Mike McKee, thank you. Equities down 1.5% on the S&P. We're down 2% on the Nasdaq 100. You take a look at the euro. Weaker on the session, struggling to bake parity. Again, one zero zero. Real close. Really right on it, John. But, Tom, you're on top of the bond move, too. Mm. It's curve inversion. Move at the front end. We're looking at 75 yeah. again, month end, at this Fed. For, for those without the history of this, and forget about the Volcker curve inversions and the huge volatility of 79 through about 82, curve inversion is rare. And, John, I would suggest anything over 20 basis points is a huge deal. John, we've gotten there in about three cups of coffee. I, the I wrong mean, kind of upside surprise, Tom. Just the yeah. wrong kind of upside surprise. Yeah.
for this Fed. The president lining up in Israel now. Let's take a look at that. For those of you on radio, the red carpet out beneath the Air Force One at Ben Gurion Airport as the president begins uh, his trip. And of course, down to Jeddah, that historic flight to Saudi Arabia here in a bit. Lindsay Piegza joins us right now, chief economist at Stiefel here. She digests what Mike McKee was talking about out in Victor, Idaho. Lindsay, your immediate reaction to this stunning report. Well, it, it certainly reinforces the upward, relentless upward trend that we've seen in prices, undermining optimism that we would see some sort of near-term relief. Now, to be fair, as, as you discussed earlier, the, the vast majority of the price pressures do seem to be centered in food and energy. And we did see some reprieve, at least on the annual basis of the core. But for the average American household, food and energy are two of the key categories of non-discretionary spending. And so when we see slightly less pressure in terms of airline fares, that offers very little reprieve for the average household struggling to fill up their car or put groceries on the table. So this is going to amp up pressure on policymakers, both in the White House and uh, monetary policymakers, to make a stronger move to provide near-term relief. And, Lindsay, this goes to a point that was highlighted in a Wall Street Journal article today, talking about how that headline number, that headline CPI figure of now 9.1 percent, is going to matter a lot more than the core number just because of inflation expectations and what the consumer is feeling. And the Fed has expressed much more concern about this. So what are you gaming out based on this number, how that could change the the sequence of uh, rate hikes, not necessarily the 75 basis points this month, but the follow-ons, September and thereafter. Well, absolutely. Typically, we exclude food and energy because they tend to be the most volatile components. So from a monetary policy standpoint, we often see the Fed focused on the core. But you're right, the average American is focused on the headline number because we pay for food and energy. So how does this translate into the pathway for Fed policy? The Fed already has that 75 basis points on the table, and this morning's report seems to solidify that 75 basis points in just uh, less than two weeks' time. But going forward, if we continue to see these elevated levels of prices, given the Fed has told us that the prerequisite for a more benign pathway is a marked decline in headline inflation, it's hard to imagine that they take a softer stance or begin to back away from additional 75 basis point increases as we move closer to the fourth quarter. Lindsay, let's go through the estimates for this Fed for year end. They've got kill PCE at 4.3 percent for 22. Can you just run me through how far off the mark you think that estimate already is? That's, that's pretty optimistic. Uh, but to be fair, historically, the Fed does appear to be overly optimistic in terms of its growth and inflation forecast, sending a more positive signal to the market and market expectations. But when we talk about the PCE at 6% right now, getting down to 4% with just five months in the year left, it's going to require markedly different conditions in the international market. We're going to have to see balance restored to global marketplaces and or resolution reached overseas, neither of which the Fed has control over. The Fed can only raise rates and tap down the demand side in terms of price pressures, but it cannot control the supply side. And I fear that in order to get to that optimistic level of 4% by the end of the year or nearer 2%, as the Fed projects by the end of next year, we will have to see vast improvement in international factors. Lindsay, domestically, I just want to understand how far the Fed's going to push it. They can't say everything you've just said, because then they raise a credibility issue. And you know if they said that, what would happen with this market? It's the Fed back in a way. Equities would rally, credit spreads would tighten, the dollar might weaken. How far do you think this Fed is going to push this? Well, according to Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Jerome Powell, he is willing to push this as far as needed, even if that means a, a marked decline in domestic activity in order to get inflation under control. Right now, they are hyper-focused, solely focused on inflation. And that is their key objective, getting that price stability. So if they need another 75 in July and three more 75 rate hikes uh, by the end of the wow. year... I think they'd be willing to do wow, it. Wow, do wow. I think that's the appropriate pathway? Absolutely not. But I, I think in order to maintain credibility and try at least and get some sort of, of relief from prices, th their hands are tied. That's Lindsay, all they have. Just amazing. Thank you. Just Lindsay Piexa there of Stiefel Tom. While you were talking, John, I was going through the wonderful table that we get from the Labor Department, and it is just a It's something from the 70s, John. There's so few series of the 40 series, say, 
where I can give you anything constructive. John, new vehicles ebbed a little bit. That's about all I got. And that's about all you can find right now, hey? Yeah. Upside surprise after upside wow. surprise. It's another one. It's the wrong kind of upside surprise. This equity market is down 1.5%. Yields are higher. The Nasdaq 100 is down more than two percentage points. Michael Gapen of Bank of America is going to be joining us on why he thinks we get a recession this year. From New York, this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Ritika Gupta. The IEA report warns that oil prices pose a high risk to the global economy. It says there are signs that fuel costs are starting to hurt demand growth. The IEA trim forecasts for oil consumption this year and next. Still, it says the demand weakness is being offset by tightening supply. The European Union may launch more legal proceedings against the UK over violations of the Northern Ireland Protocol and the Brexit Agreement. Bloomberg's learned the EU could take action before the end of the month. The bloc is unhappy over a bill being considered by the British Parliament. It would let the UK unilaterally rewrite the bulk of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And a chaotic day in Sri Lanka where a state of emergency was declared after President Gotabaya Rajapaska fled the country. Protesters gathered outside the presidential palace and later seized the state-run broadcaster, forcing it to go off the air. Sri Lanka is bankrupt, partly due to Rajapaska's policies. Inflation is running at 70% and there is a shortage of food, fuel and medicine. And once again, Spirit Airlines has delayed a shareholder vote on its proposed merger with Frontier. Earlier this week, Frontier said it was still very far from winning enough support because of a higher offer from JetBlue. The new shareholder vote is set for July the 27th. And a quarter of Americans say their next car will be an electric vehicle. According to a survey by the American Automobile Association, more than three-fourths of them say their interest is driven by a desire to save on fuel costs. Last year, only 3.2% of U.S. vehicles were EVs. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I look at the Fed and, and I think it takes its direction from its boss. Its boss is the economy and the bond market, in my view. And right now, I think there's a pretty consistent message coming from the Fed's bosses that they need to think about wrapping this tightening cycle up. Jim Paulson, a Luthold, and he is out in the Midwest where they feel inflation. At least just on the break, I've gotten a couple of notes from people saying, forget about the financial stuff, core, trim this and that. It is about headline inflation, 9.1%. Uh, at this moment, the president at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv is the prime minister and president of Israel speak. And I know it's about foreign policy, but you've got to believe, Lisa, there's exactly one statistic on his mind. 9.1%. It's sort of shocking because it's coming in higher also than all of the estimates out there. And it's shocking markets. We're seeing a real big reaction just moments ago. We we saw uh, the euro trade through parity, right. uh, that key figure people have been looking for with the dollar. But really, it's the curve inversion. It's that the idea of recession is becoming more and more prevalent in people's minds because what will it take <clears throat> to bring inflation down at a time when it's very real and it's causing right. real pain, given the fact, and I want to just raise this statistic, real wages are really not keeping up with inflation. They are negative 4.4% currently. That is the lowest that right. we've seen going back to 2006. And not to get mathy here, there's too much going on, but the integrand of those real wages, the duration of that negative real wage is stunning. Lisa, we've got to go through the data now. Futures negative 63, Dow futures negative 367, 30,600 on the Dow. The VIX out of stick almost to two, 28.91. Lisa, let's go to your world. Curve inversion, now tangible. And that's because you're seeing a real uh, sell-off at the front end of the yield curve. Basically, the message here is the Fed will have to go big and it will have to go bold and that it will do more than people previously expected. That's the sense that we're getting. Currently, 3.16%. How much do you see that bleed into a feeling that perhaps they're going to pull back, allow inflation to pick up over the longer term? But this report mm -hmm. really highlights a fear in markets that the Fed has gotten it wrong before, <clears throat> that they're going to get it wrong again, and that economists are not keeping pace with how quickly prices are increasing. Two quick points. I'm going to do some data, then I want to talk about one concept, uh, Lisa. Yen moves here. 137.56 is a weaker yen on a dollar. I'm going to call it resilient with a 108 DXY uh, level. And the other thing I'd look at, folks, let's not forget 
EM and the ramifications of Jerome Powell's 9.1% inflation on emerging markets, Lisa, that's tangible. Especially because what we're seeing right now is that the haven trade continues to be the dollar. We hear that from one and another in, uh, investment analyst. How much does that just increase the pain for economies that depend on marginal growth that just isn't there? Readjusting Michael O'Rourke, chief market strategist at Jones Trading uh, today. Michael, how does your world change with a 9.1% print? Well, I mean, it's very consistent with where we've been. Obviously, we've seen this inflation rising for over a year now. Markets have been concerned about it. And the main concern is that the Fed's been behind the curve. And that was proven true once again today. So I expect inve investors to continue to be defensive. And I think it's going to be a rough road the second half of 2022. Does this inflation read, uh, Michael, change anything in your view in your trading strategy today? Uh, it doesn't. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of hype around this number, a lot of high expectations that the number would be um, hotter than expected, and it was. Uh, I will say the one, I guess, the bright spot in there is the fact that the uh, core CPI uh, continued its slight downtrend, and that you know that peak was still at 6.5% 6, 6 year-over-year growth back in March. Um, and then when you look at WTI crude being around $100 and starting to come back in, if energy continues to come back in, that will be a hopeful sign. But the problem is, is we're still looking at asset valuations that are still pretty expensive uh, relative to where the economy is and the fact that we have significant rate, rate hikes ahead of us. How much does core CPI matter going forward and how much is this purely going to be a headline figure for a Fed trained on consumer expectations? Well, I, I, you know, as you noted, the Fed is focused on the headline right now, but as long as the crude keeps coming down, as long as energy prices come down, or at least they've put their peak in for this cycle or this move for 2022, then core becomes a more meaningful number. And you can see expectations shift towards a focus on core. Obviously, if, if we continue to have an energy crisis, that if there's another flare up or we see WTI make a run back towards 125, the headline number becomes the focus again. But I think in the second half of the year, I think um, people will start to shift the focus towards core. Again, it's still not a pretty situation, but obviously it's not as terrible as, as a 9.1% year over year growth reading looks. Uh, CIBC reporting in from Toronto, Catherine Judge, as we noted earlier, she says shelter, a major contributor in Catherine Judge, really quite importantly on the deceleration that Michael O'Rourke just discussed, really saying this is so much base effects, which is some mumbo jumbo for looking back 12 months, if you will. We won't go into that right now. Michael, the, the thing this devolves down to is the earnings season, which begins, I believe, Lisa, uh, it's tomorrow as well. How does inflation devolve down to the revenue view forward for corporations? Well, it, it's tricky here, right? I because agree. Yeah. You're, you're seeing these, these good revenue numbers because people have been raising prices. But uh, Delta Airlines might be a great example today. Uh, obviously, they're, they're talking about how strong business is, how much demand there is, right? But they missed on the bottom line. And, you know, if you look at their earnings... Uh, I, I think X Energy, their their costs were up 20 percent or 19 percent versus uh, versus 2019. So I think that that's that's the squeeze we're seeing. I don't think you can trust the revenue number, I guess per se, and you really have yeah. to watch to see where the margins are being squeezed for profits. Michael O'Rourke, thank you so much with Jones Trading today. Futures negative 59, Dow futures negative 351, the VIX 28.70. Uh, Lisa, the president begins a pageantry in the Middle East with all of the history, including the flight from Tel Aviv to Jeddah uh, coming up, and to redound that into where we are now, to, to fold that in rather to where we are now, Brent crude under 100. Wasn't it two days ago, Lisa, Brent crude was it 124? It's been an incredibly volatile picture with the range of potential outcomes getting increasingly wide at historic levels because if you get some sort of increasing concern about recession, you could see those prices can come down. On the flip side, if Russia does cut off gas supplies to Europe, you could start to see some real disruptions there. But Tom, this all goes to the moment that we're in, which is exogenous factors and high unpredictability of inflation that is raging at the highest level going back to 1981. Well, as Tony Dwyer said, 
says over at Canaccord, you, you got to just follow what the data says. We are data dependent, and this morning we are dependent on a higher inflation rate. In the intraday of the 2-10 spread, Lisa Bramwitz's world uh, here of bonds, I mean, I'm sorry, Lisa, it speaks volumes moving out to a negative 15.41 at worst. And just to give you a sense of the moment and the mood, right now there is a 30% chance being priced into markets of a 100 basis point move by the Federal Reserve coming up. So just to give you a I sense know that. of wow. how people are looking how you to potentially up. more aggressive action by the Gee, Fed. What does it mean for the auction this afternoon? Well, that's a good question. Is it actually create more demand? I was demand? kidding. You're serious. Oh, 100%. I'm going to take that and run. <laughs> Futures negative 57. <laughs> Stay with Bloomberg on radio, on television. Good morning.